Absolutely, guys. Well, let's get going. So um, a couple of things that I want to let you guys know today, it looks like our numbers are kind of chilling out, which is great, leveling out. Um, and uh, we've got about, you know, 10,000 people in the room today, as we like to say on these webinars. We'll inflate that number by some factor that we won't tell you. But no, we've got a great crowd here today. We're so glad to have you here. And if there's anything I can tell you about today's webinar, uh, there's two things to know up front that are super duper important. The first, as you've already discovered, is that there is a chat section. Now, with 10,000 or maybe 100,000 people in the room, um, the chat section is not a good place to ask questions. It's a cool place to say stuff, talk to people. You know, you can say what you want in there. But ultimately, there's also a Q&A section of Zoom. And uh, use the Q&A form if, hey, Chuck's here, so good to have you. And make sure you use that Q&A section um, if, for example, you need to, uh, let's make you a panelist, Chuck, okay. We'll use that Q&A section um, if you have a question. And we'll stop a couple times during the webinar to take questions. As questions come in, I'll glance at them. And if it's something, as I'm going through something that I'm like, okay, I should just stop and answer this, I'll do that. Other times, I'll know that I'll be getting to something that somebody's asking a question about, or I'll just wait for the questions if it's uh, not within the scope of today's webinar. And so to get started, guys, here's what you need to do, as I mentioned before. Uh, the main window of this, if you can set it full screen on your device, that is best so you can really see what's going on. Uh, remove any distractions. You've got my phone's on silent. Hopefully yours is too. And hopefully the uh, fine moderators are here to just, you know, help keep things smooth for me. Um, they do a great job every week and I'm so appreciative for them. And so today, guys, uh, what we're going to cover, and again, if you can't um, basically, you know, just on the set full screen note here, um, if you're only on one device with one screen, um, you kind of either have to set it full screen or try to follow along in capture without watching it, which isn't really, um, it depends how, you know, it depends how much you use capture before, right? Um, whether or not um, you can get away with that. But what I would recommend is um, having it on a second device if you can and having it full screen there than having capture on your main device. If that's not an option for you, that's totally fine. Um, just, uh, you know, go ahead and focus on watching it and really ingesting what we're talking about today um, so you don't get lost. So, what are we going to cover today? So the basic gist of it, you guys all saw the, the basic outline that we, we sent out, is that uh, we're going to do about a three-hour webinar today, okay? And uh, we're going to cover the basics of capture. And so this is a three-hour basic webinar, meaning that we're going to start with the basics. If you don't even really know what capture is, we're going to talk about that, what it is, how you can use it. There he is. Mr. Admi as a panelist. <laughs> We're going to talk about, there you go, bud. Um, and uh, Matthias, before, okay, before I talk, let's have him go ahead and uh, say hello. Yo, yo, anybody there? Yo, yo, we are here. Excellent. Let's see if I can join you in video real quick. Oh, can you allow me on video? Oh, yeah. If I stop the screen share, maybe that lets you. Does that let you know? What do I need to do? It says you cannot start your video because your host has stopped it. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to try to figure that out while you talk. I can I make you the host. I just want to say hello real quick. Yeah, make me a host real quick. Maybe okay, and then make me back. Cool. You're the host. There you are. Hey, sorry for barging in here really quick. We just finished our uh, elation hour. I just want to say hello really quick. And um, thanks for everybody joining here on the Capture 101 class. That's great. First time we've uh, been doing this uh, together with Elation, Obsidian Control System, and uh, of course, Capture. Very thankful for David that he is uh, doing this here for us. So I hope uh, you're going to enjoy learning about Capture. Um, it's a really great program. We're going to do more integration with uh, the Onyx platform uh, this year. So you're going to see more of that come together. So it's a good time to learn this. And even you know, if you don't use any Elation, any Onyx, that's fine. We'll still hope that you will find Capture useful in your workflow. I know a lot of you are Vectorworks users out there, so it works really great with that. So yeah. 
hope uh, you find this class useful. And that's something we'd like to do uh, every other week. So I'll leave you to it. Thank you so much. Awesome. I'm going to reshare my screen, but you may have to make me the host, especially before you leave. For sure. All right. Let me get all my stuff back. Good. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Matthias. All right. Let me just pull up all my screens again because some of them disappeared. Uh, everybody can see my slide, right? And uh, you can just let me know in the chat if you can see the slide and hear me just to verify that I'm not just talking to the wall. Though the wall is good company, um, real humans are better. Awesome, guys. So what we're going to cover today is uh, very first, we're going to go through the basics of the Capture Visualizer. That's going to be the overall um, scheme. That's, that's what we're focusing on today. And we're going to start by talking about what's new in Capture 2020, knowing that some people are brand new to the concept of Capture here, uh, maybe don't know what it is at all, and we're going to go over that. And then some of you maybe have used Capture for some time, Maybe you've been a long time Capture user. Maybe you've used it a little bit. Um, either way, we'll teach you the basics. And then last but not least, point you into some direction, into some resources where you can find more info and help. Uh, so who are we talking to today? Well, as Matthias mentioned, I'm David from LearnStageLighting.com. That answers that well. And then what is Capture? So. Capture is a really interesting program to me. I, I was thinking about this and I think about it anytime I go to teach it because it's kind of got two sides to it. Meaning that um, I usually think of it first as a 3D visualizer for pre-visualizing, uh, you know, pre-programming from a lighting console, etc. cetera. Um, that's usually how I think of it. However, you actually don't even have to use it with a console and some people, actually use it to make artistic renderings and, and to build those without even having a console controlling it. And so that's something that's really interesting to me about Capture. And I think you guys might find interesting as well, is that um, maybe a lot of people in here think of it as, okay, this is something I'm going to use to pre-program. I might take some shots and send them to my clients uh, to sell them on something, you know, once we get back to doing live events. Uh, but you know, you think of it as something that you control with a console. The interesting thing, and we'll get into this at, at times today during the webinar, is that um, it can be used with or without a console controlling capture. And so that's uh, really important and worth knowing as well, too. Now, the top question that we get about capture, the top question, I hear this all the time when people are thinking about going ahead with capture, and people say, okay, what computer do I need? to run Capture? And this is like the biggest loaded question in the history of the world. Because if you're using Capture to visualize 10 lights, you can kind of get away with the inbuilt graphics on a computer. It's, the computer will definitely run into overdrive. It won't be the best visualization ever, but you can get by with it. Um, really what matters the most is the number of fixtures and even um, more narrowed down than that is the number of beams that are on at a certain time, the number of light beams that you see. Um, you know, other things matter too, but as Capture themselves kind of let us know, um, you, you definitely need a graphics card if you're going to be using Capture a lot, whether that's a laptop with the graphics. Um, I think external ones work on laptops as well, or a desktop with a graphics card. And the big key with graphics card is not price. Price doesn't matter. <laughs> what matters is, uh, you know, RAM doesn't matter. Um, but what matters is the pass mark score. And, and there's a great page on Capture's website. Um, I think it's under the support tab, which goes into detail about kind of how to look at that pass mark score and, and understand what uh, graphics capabilities you have or you might be looking at. Um, because if you ask 10 people that use Capture what video card you, they need, you might get 10 different issues. And so um, really, you know, it's more graphics card intensive than any other part of the computer. Um, and so just be aware of that uh, for your future. So versions of Capture. This is something else that um, sometimes confuses people at the start, but actually is the way that Capture is very generous with the demo versions and such. Let me explain. 
So when you go to Capture's website to their downloads page, this is the first thing that you see. You see Capture 2020 for Windows 64 and Mac OS. Okay. And then it's got this blurb about demo and full version. So if you download the full version and you don't license it, you don't buy a license and you don't import your license file, then basically um, you get 90 minutes to use the full capture as a demo. You can't save, okay? And so that's kind of the big deal. But that's what we'll focus on today. If you're in that demo version, you can totally follow along today. However, there's some interesting things about that. Actually, before we get there, we'll talk about uh, paid versions. So there are various paid versions of Capture. You can license it uh, by the universe. There's Solo, one universe, Duet, two, uh, Quad, four universe, uh, which is the quad, or I, um, it's escaping me right now, that's okay. And then there's also the uh, Symphony, the completely unlocked full universe version, okay? Now, when you buy it, there's a, a cost to it, but then you're able to upgrade over time. And this is an area where Capture, I've found, is really generous because you can upgrade every year, but you don't necessarily have to, okay? Um, they let you upgrade within a five-year limit, basically, from, when you, from the year that you first buy it. Um, but if you are upgrading your license count, at least from everything I know, um, you do have to do that within the same year. So if you want to go from solo to, to duet, uh, you got to do that within the year that you bought it or upgraded, et cetera. Um, but if you do look at their site, one thing to factor in, you know, when you buy it, because people talk to me about Capture a lot and they look at it for, you know, maybe they want a bunch of universes, maybe they look at a few and they're like, you know, it's fairly costly um, and it is an investment, right? Um, but if you look at the cost to upgrade it, it's really low. Um, and so once you kind of get in and first buy Capture, keeping it up to date is not super duper expensive, Okay. Now, if we scroll down a little bit on that downloads page, you've probably already done this, um, but it's just Capture's website here, and I'll actually paste it in the chat so it can disappear. Um, Before we move on, David, I just want to clarify as well Hi, on the licensing upgrades. You can change your version, or excuse me, your edition within uh, any time. You just have, have to simply update your version first, and then you can change your channel count. So if you're in 2019, you would pay for the 2020 upgrade and then you can change your channel count. Yeah, exactly. So um, that is, it's, it's just, sometimes that confuses people, but it's pretty simple. And uh, the upgrading, especially for like the higher universe counts is super reasonable. Now, on uh, downloads page, I just, I just copied it into the chat, but it's the capture downloads page. And the next thing you get to is the sample projects. Now, if you're going to follow along with today, um, go ahead and download the club one. I put a big arrow to it here because we'll open that about halfway through today's webinar and work with it a little bit, show you how to work with a file that's already created that's got some more stuff in it. Um, and that one's the smallest, so I chose that since you're downloading it, well, on a webinar. Um, I figured that would probably be a good idea. Plus, we can go in there together and explore our favorite things about the lights from yesteryear that are uh, in that file. Um, now, along with that, when we scroll down a little further, we see the library updates. And so, even if you're not updating the version every year, they are always updating the fixture library, and that's important to know. Um, and you can actually update the fixture library anytime, and it's actually separate from the software install. Now, I believe, um, you know, pretty much major versions within the year of the software install, they do update the library, and I've noticed they do that. Um, but they'll update the library more often, and you can download that here and, and bring it in. And uh, they've got versions for all the older versions of Capture as well through those last five years, um, same as the upgrade cycle. Now that we're here talking about versions of Capture, I mentioned when we went here before that, um, that there's the demo version that you can use for 90 minutes, but not save. Um, but then if you really want to dive in and learn Capture, there's actually somewhat of a better option, um, just if you're looking at it before you're, you're looking to purchase. And that's the student edition, okay? Now, Student edition, as it says on the first line there, is slightly misleading. Um, not really, but it doesn't matter if you're a student or not. What it is basically is it's a unlimited version of Capture um, universe-wise 
but you have a very reduced amount of fixtures, okay? So if you see that, that list of fixtures there, you'll see it's a lot of yesterday's big hits um, of lighting fixtures, a lot of stuff that I remember using, sometimes occasionally see um, out there in the real world. Um, but the great thing about it is you can save, you can launch it, you can have it open for as long as you want. And so if you're trying to get in there and really check it out, you want to check it out for more than 90 minutes, maybe you don't care about what fixtures you have, then you might want to try out the student edition for a while, see if it's the right thing for you, and then you can buy the full version uh, later. So this brings us to Capture 2020, okay? Uh, I highlighted a couple things that are new here, but I'm gonna copy into the chat here, just a link that has all of the, the new features in it. Um, but some of the bigger ones that, I, that I've seen are A, reflection planes. And this means uh, if you've got anything shiny on stage, you can make it shiny and it looks shiny. Um, that's the, the quick answer there. Then there are focus planes, which are actually really cool. Um, you can look at light levels and see kind of a heat map of the light level on a specific place on the stage um, or whatever kind of room you're in. Um, then there's GITF, which is a 3D model format that you're able to import uh, into Capture Now. Notice this is not the same as GDTF. Um, that's general device type format, that's different. Um, then there's scaffolding, which is new. Um, it even has parts and pieces that snap together, um, just like Legos. And then there are also, um, and this is a big one actually, it is the visualization improvements and efficiency. Um, every year, you know, pretty much, I think, they're always making capture more efficient, which I think is really interesting. Um, like, you know, two, three years ago, when I got this computer and this graphics card that I'm using now, um, I was running, I think I was running Arco, Maybe I was running like a three, four year old version at that point. And then I upgraded to 2019. And jumping a few versions, you notice really quickly that every year they actually make it more efficient. And so when I upgraded my capture, um, I thought that because um, quality of renderings had improved, I thought that it was going to be tougher on my computer. That would, you know, make a lot of sense. However, it actually turned out that I could visualize more fixtures smoothly um, because every year they're making it more efficient and that is really cool stuff. Awesome guys. So enough of that, uh, enough slides. Let's actually dive in and talk about Capture and get in there. So if you've got Capture, um, a full version or a demo version, go ahead and launch it now. I'll give you a second or two to, to, to do that. Awesome, guys. So uh, when you first launch Capture, this is the main screen that you get. If you've never seen it before, I'll just run you through it. It's been the same for, you know, years. Um, you see your recent projects here, and you can open up a file explorer uh, here to get more projects. There is a licensing key. Um, this allows you to uh, enter your license key, et cetera, manage that. And then there is start using Capture, which is basically a create a new file button. And we're gonna do that here first thing, okay? We're gonna just press start using capture and I'm gonna maximize it to full screen here. Um, basically, we're gonna start and we're gonna do up to about 90 minutes of time in, in this, in case you're in the demo version. And then we're gonna close it and we're gonna open up that club demo. So just keep that in mind. Um, and so when we first launch it, it can look a little bit like, you know, maybe you're, um, let me go ahead and move these meeting controls around. Okay, very good. Um, and so hopefully that message disappears in a second. Yes, this can look a little bit, you know, to people a little bit confusing at first. Um, but all you have to know about these four windows is that three of them are exactly the same thing. Um, this is just the default layout, but there are other ways actually to lay out capture. We're going to stick in this default a lot today. Um, but there's a few things I want to share with you. So the first is that in the corner of any of these screens, we can use this, this pointing arrow, and that's gonna make it a uh, full size. And then we can use the eject button arrow, you know, it kind of looks like the eject button on a CD player. Um, and that's gonna pop the, the window out to make it separate. So if you have a separate display or something, you can send it over there, et cetera. One of the nice things about this is whenever you pop a view out, if you wanna bring it back, you just escape it, and it pops back in. Really, really smooth, really helpful there. And so 
this fourth one in the right corner is a little bit different. And this is where you're going to be managing a lot of settings and things like this. Uh, this is where I, I spend a lot of time actually, because there's a lot of things that we're going to do in here. And so just, you know, do be aware of that, um, that these three are actually really customizable. Just to show you a couple different things, um, you can, we can scroll with our scroll wheel in and out on any of the views. And then we can also navigate through different cameras. And so we can go here to camera and then control uh, one or Apple, one, two, three, our top, front, and a section. And then there's also programmable positions on a five through nine. And so really helpful uh, to be able to just go here and you know control one, two, three, switch up your different windows um, real quick. We can also use these different arrows to navigate through our window. And so we can look around and move around uh, using this first one, which is kind of the, the curved around the corner arrow. Then we've got the front and back arrow, which kind of zooms us in the 3D space. And I'm just going to go ahead and press control one now to take myself back. Um, one thing as well, guys, just we'll go over this more later, but in any of the views, you can go and uh, go live with control R on PC. And when you go live, you then uh, are rendering that live with your graphics card. You're able to, to see the lights in 3D. And we'll be doing that in a minute. For now, I'm going to go back to wireframe. And so... The, the first thing that I want to do is just start building some scenic elements, okay? Before we bring some lights in, right, the first thing you got to do on any stage is have something to work with. And so to do that, guys, um, let's go ahead and actually go and just look over the project real quick. And so before you start anything else, I mean, really, you can do it anytime. You can go ahead and fill out the project info right here. Um, and so you can just go in here, you can type... Um, you know, the name of your project and any other really important info that you want to add in about um, the lighting designer, you know, the version, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and you can fill that all out here. You can change that as you go. It's just something to be aware of because um, this stuff's going to show up on, on printouts and stuff. So um, it's always good to put that in there just like any other CAD, CAD drawing you may do. Um, and so let's go ahead and build our, our very first thing. So we'll go in here to library. And library is where we're going to bring objects in to capture. Now, capture's got a lot built into it, okay? You can see here there's built in, which are um, all kinds of interesting things. Um, distance, angles, these are kind of uh, visualization only things. You know, things like DMX motors, rigging points, water jet smoke, those reflection and focus planes we talked about, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then we have recent, and um, we have objects. These are going to be, as we see here, you know, various industry objects as well as um, the forms is just boxes and stuff like that. Then we have materials. We'll get into those in a few minutes. Truss fixtures, uh, which is going to be lighting fixtures and video projectors, stuff like that. Then we have symbols, filters, and gobos, which uh, can be applied to, to lights that can take those. Of course, if we're working with a lot of LEDs and movers, uh, we're not going to use these as much, but if you work with a lot of conventional lights, uh, specifically like in a theater, you may be using filters and gobos quite a bit. So let's go ahead and just go to objects. And we're going to then go to forms and start with a simple box. We'll kind of lay this down as a floor. And so I'm just going to drag this box in. Um, whenever you, you drag it in, it, it generally orients to the view you drag it in. So I'm going to drag it into the top view. And once I drag it in, the next thing I really want to do is resize it. And so we'll go to the design tab and then go to selected items. Now, the design tab is, is super helpful. Um, the selected items is where you're going to spend a lot of time modifying things. And so we scroll down, and we'll see here at the bottom, box, width, height, and depth. depth. And so we're going to make this a floor. So I'm just going to make this 100 feet by 100 feet, um, or rather not height, 100 feet, height, you know, 6 inches because it's going to just be the floor. 
and then depth 100 feet. Awesome. And so once we've done that, we can see now, okay, in our top view, we've got a massive old floor or the ground. And then we've got in our front view, a floor right here, you know, it's, it's flat. And then on the side view here from the right, we see the same thing. All right. Let us go ahead and uh, get a few more pieces in. And so uh, when we talk about, you know, bringing different floors and walls in, one, one exercise that I like to do at first is just to build kind of a square room, make it pretty simple. And so if we press uh, right here on this cog for this item, we can clone or control C. With clone, we're going to create an exact clone, and we're able to set the X, Y, and Z offset or how far it moves in either direction, especially if we're cloning something multiple times, and then a number of clones. And so I'm just going to go, I'm just going to Z offset it two feet um, and create two clones. Press clone. Okay, so now we've offset it. We can kind of see here, if I scroll in, we can see on the end, you can see all three there. And so I could just select, say, the middle one. And now I want to turn this to make some walls. And so we've got this, this guy right here, which is our, our, our turning. So I can just go ahead, turn that. Now notice I can see uh, at the end of my, right over here at the end of the object, I can see the amount of degrees I'm turning it. If I hold shift, it's going to snap. And you probably see how it shows that in the upper corner for me. So I, I get it where I want it, and then I'm able to just drag in that area and move it wherever I want. Now you may see where I'm dragging, and if you drag as well, you may see these purple lines, and the purple lines are indicating that these objects are snapping together. So I'll grab the other one, give that a turn. Now we've got another wall. Now I'm in the top view here, and so maybe I go select one of these, Control C to clone, or remember, we'll press our cog and the top option there is clone. This time I just want to clone one of these guys. I can turn that, drag it into view. And so now we've got kind of a room built. If I use my move around, you see, I can kind of see here, it's a very tall room. I can see how the, the different walls come together. Again, we're just kind of illustrating it here. And so now that we've got kind of a, a venue built because we start from nothing, we could start to build some stuff in it, start to bring some lights in, et cetera. In fact, I'm just gonna clean up my walls a little bit. Snap this one to this end. Center this guy back up. Get a really nice, maybe drop the floor a little, sure. Awesome. And so now we can see in our different views, we see our stage. We're able to see how it works. So once we've got kind of a basic room set up, the next thing we want to do is, uh, well, let's bring, let's, let's add some materials to it uh, just before we bring some lights in. And so materials are in the 3D realm. I'll actually take my, my beta view here to live mode, control R. And then I will go to views here in the design tab. Now this is the beta view and I'm going to go ahead and do a couple things. The first is that I'm going to go to ambient lighting for beta view and I'm going to drag that up. Okay. Because once I get some ambient lighting in, I can now find where in the world I am and point this around. Of course, we'll bring that back down when we start turning the lights on, but just like any show in any venue, um, you're going to go ahead and uh, be able to, to do that. Awesome. So we'll turn up that, that uh, turn up those house lights until we're ready to turn them down, et cetera. Scroll in there real nice. Um, you see in a lot of other controls in here and we'll, we'll use some various controls throughout today. Uh, one thing that I do like to highlight, um, especially on the graphics card question, people are often like, um, you know, how am I doing? Is it, you know, really hurting on my computer? Is it not? Etc. Of course, you can always open Activity Monitor on a Mac or um, the um, Shift Control Escape, the uh, Task Manager. That's what it's called on Windows, and see how much it's hammering your your graphics card or your computer. Um, but you can also go to the rendering settings right here, and I recommend doing this, and turn on that quality information. Um, there are a lot of settings in here, 
but uh, turning on that quality information definitely helps because then we get up in the corner here some detail about okay how many frames a second are we doing um and um you know what is the detail level and the detail level actually just as a little aside um is basically um based on from what I can tell the size of the canvas, the size of the window. So if I make the window bigger, we see the amount of potential detail goes up. If I make it smaller, it brings down the amount of potential detail. Um, and so that is important as well. Um, and so um, that's the basics on rendering settings, but getting back to where I was, um, let's go ahead and bring in some trusses and some lights and stuff, because that's what we're here to do. And so first things first, we're gonna go back to the library and let's go to truss first. Here we've got all sorts of good truss here, all sorts of stuff. Uh, we can choose whatever brand we want. What should I choose today? I'll just go to generic. Cause I don't wanna choose the wrong brand, but that's okay. And so say we grab just a two meter section. Um, you'll see as you go through different brands, of course, some of them, you know, like uh, Global Trust, you know, here with Elation are gonna be in meters because that's what they make. Other brands, of course, that, you know, sell it in feet are gonna have uh, models that are in feet. And so use whatever you think is gonna be on your show. Um, so we'll just go to Global Trust here, actually. Grab a two meter section and drag it in. Now, I really advocate, um, you can drag it into the live view. You can drag it into any of the views, but I definitely, I definitely advocate dragging into 2D. I think it's a lot simpler to drag it into the 2D world and then um, find it in the 3D world um, and, and see how it looks. If you start moving things around in the 3D world, it can get really funky really quick and, and you can get things out of alignment and not really see it well. Um, whereas if you start in that 2D world, you know you'll, your things are aligned. You can get them lined up really good and then um, beforehand, you know, you're gonna be able to, to do that. Um, you're gonna be able to make sure they're good. Awesome, guys. So I've got this piece of truss and now I'm just gonna get it turned. And now we'll go ahead and clone it. We'll do four of them. And we will put it in the, let's see, X, Y should be the Y direction. I just typed 2M for two meters there. Um, and you can see it matches the six foot, 6.7 inch uh, description, which two meters is actually, um, yeah. Nope, Y was not the right direction. That's okay, Control Z obviously works. And I can just press it and Control clone again. Go X, nope, it's Z, all right. I'm all discombobulated in my head, but that's okay. Um, so we can go and control that one. This time we'll take it, take our X to zero, take our Z, two meters. Perfect. Clone that guy up. So now we've got a nice truss here. It's all perfectly at length. Um, but if we had just dragged them in individually and they weren't all connected in, in, in a length like this, you can take them, pull them apart, and you see here, I get a little lightning bolt and they, they snap together when you get them close. And so that allows you to make sure you've got just the right length connected. Um, and that is important, obviously, because you want to be as accurate with your distances and stuff as, as possible. You, know, you, don't, you definitely do. Um, and so let's go ahead now and start to bring in some lights. We're just going to do a simple, simple truss here um, and, and put some lights on it so we can really see what's going on. So I've zoomed here, actually, I'll bring this truss a little closer to us. Awesome. And uh, actually, before we bring lights in, I had mentioned materials earlier and I was about to get to it, but I got sidetracked and that's okay. Um, so we've got our materials tab here and materials can be applied to any object. Um, some objects like this truss, for example, if I select my truss, and I go to the design tab to selected items, we'll see that it has a color to it. It's, it's basically got a material that's attached to the piece of truss already. Um, things like these forms, however, 
um, can have a material added to them. Here at the bottom of this box form, I see there's an option to add a material. And so I don't add my material here, but rather I go here to my library, I go to my materials and I can find the material that I want. And so we'll just choose something matte. Um, we'll, do, we'll do this dim gray. And then we can literally just drag it on to our surface. Actually, we'll go regular gray on the floor, dim gray on the walls, just to give us a little, maybe light gray on the third wall, just to give us a little more sense of space in this space. And so we can just drag those on there. And, and once we've done that under the selected items here, we can see that, that info there. We can also go to the materials tab here. It's gonna show us any materials that are in our file. Um, now is actually a great time to save thinking of our file. So I'm just gonna press control S or of course, good old file save because Capture is a very stable program. But like anything, nothing is perfect. The power goes out, somebody bothers you, whatever. Um, you know, saving often is very important. And so anyways, this shows our materials, all of the ones in our show. And we can actually see here, we're able to customize these materials within Capture. And so there's a lot of customization options like metallic, for example, is kind of a brightness to it. Um, luminance is, is uh, if it's casting light, like a computer monitor or an LED panel. Um, there's a lot of good stuff in here and you can change the color. You can modify all of this stuff to your needs um, as well. And so that's important to know. These are basic, just basic color um, textures so far. And so color textures are pretty simple um, in the sense of the texture width and height doesn't really affect things. Uh, when we bring in image or video textures, we'll see how that becomes a lot more important for us. So let's go ahead actually. So we've got a couple things that we've drawn in here, okay? We've got our truss and we've got our room. And right now they're just kind of all floating out in 3D land. And as we begin, to, we, we begin to add fixtures in, it might make sense to build this into some different layers. Now, um, if any of you guys have worked with CAD software before, probably a lot of you have worked with CAD type software before, whether that be Vectorworks or AutoCAD or um, something else. I know I saw a question there about Vectorworks earlier. Um, you know, you're used to working with layers, even if you've worked with image editing software, et cetera. And so here in Capture, we've, we've got them right here. And so I'm just gonna go and name default layer. Um, we'll call this um, room. And then it's just as simple as adding right here, pressing add, and then we can call this one truss. You're even able, there's, there's a lot of things you can do. Like for example, this screen color just allows you to uh, identify the objects in it with a color. But, uh, but we can go ahead then and add a third layer. And that layer is going to be called lights. Of course, this is a very simple uh, scheme with just a few layers, but you can do more, you can do less. Note this first tab, current, we'll wanna put that onto lights, just like um, other programs, like CAT programs especially. The layer that you make the current layer is the layer that as you bring objects in, they'll be added to that layer. Now I'm just gonna go ahead, take my truss, go to selected items, and then we can go ahead and layer do, 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 right here. It's in room, we'll move it to truss. Awesome, we're good to go. Perfect. So now that we've done that, we'll verify that uh, under layers we're on lights, good. And then we can go ahead and we can totally go ahead to, getting distracted by the chat, I shouldn't do that, to, um, to library, because we're gonna add some lights in. And so let's go to our favorite manufacturer on today's call, which is Elation. So there's two ways to filter through the library here. Um, you can scroll through them. And as you'll notice, just like you notice when you walk around a trade show, if you've ever been to, to LDI or one of the other trade shows, um, there's a lot of manufacturers, you know, even more than you'd see at a trade show because there's some of these that, you know, would, might not ever show up at a trade show because they're smaller. Um, so searching is uh, gonna be the key to really help you a lot. For example, we'll go to Elation's Artiste series. You'll see that we get some lights under Elation. 
However, if I choose something that um, is a little more generic under different brands, like maybe I just look for a wash, now I'm going to see, okay, it, it pops up elation because I was in there last, but I can see every brand in here that has a wash to it. Um, I'm going to go back to Artiste, that's A-R-T-I-S-T-E. And then let's go ahead and choose the Artiste Da Vinci. Okay, we're going to go ahead and bring that in. So I'm going to zoom in just a little bit on my top view. Bring that guy in. Awesome. We see here I'm snapping it to my truss. You saw that little lightning symbol. That's always a good sign because we see as well in our visualization that uh, that, that has snapped to the truss. Very good. And so now I'm going to go ahead. There's a couple things I'm going to do. First, I'm just going to clone. Okay, so I'm going to control C to make a bunch of these. And uh, let's do them every three feet and do number of clones nine for a total of 10 fixtures. Okay, and then that's going to be on the Z offset. That's they're three feet apart. Press clone. We see they went this way, but that's okay. We will go ahead, press here, and then we'll just move them keeping that lightning bolt, and then we know we're good. Center it up here. Of course, there are the grid lines uh, that can really help you center things up and get things, uh, especially when you're working off of a scaled drawing instead of kind of just working in the uh, imaginary world like we're doing here. And if you uh, are happening to work and you want to change the scale, you know, of these grid lines, you totally can. That's a good point, actually, is that by default, they're one meter by one meter. Um, obviously, if you're not in the U.S., that's great for you. If you're in the U.S., you might want to change that, you know, depending on how you work. Um, meters are great, but most people don't use them in the U.S., unfortunately. And so you could just go under um, Views. You can go down to da -da -da -da, Grid Width and Grid Height. Um, oh, they actually are at one foot in this new document. I, I often work off older documents that were in the meters. So, um, But you can change that either way depending on uh, what you prefer. So anyways, back to our lights. Now we see in this tab fixtures, we have our fixtures here, okay? We see we created them uh, backwards and we put them in. And so um, that is how they are at. And they are presently, we can see a couple things about them, okay? Um, how did I get the top right look of a solid room? Get Great question and hi, Giancarlo. Um, and so, um, Hold on, we're going to answer your questions. Um, so getting the visualization, the live mode, we press on this little green uh, three slash menu and we can go to live mode, control R on a PC. And live mode is where you get it kind of looking like the room. Okay, and if you don't have any lights in the room, you'll have to go, we did this already, but you'll have to go to views, find the view you're in, I'm in beta view, and then find ambient lighting, bring that up so you can start to see stuff. Awesome. So. We're here in fixtures, and there's a number of things that we can see here within our, our, our fixtures. One, we see um, the location, if we had notated that, and we can notate it here. We see the unit number, channel number, groups, um, and then we see the name. Okay, so that's the name of the light, the actual, you know, model. The circuit can also be added, um, but then we get the patch. And the patch is important because this is where we're going to patch it uh, to match our lighting console if we're controlling this from a lighting console, okay? Then we'll see mode. So mode allows us to change that mode. We can do any modes that that light has that, of course, are in the library, okay? And I do recommend setting that mode if you're not going to go with the, the standard one. Uh, do that before you clone. It makes it a little bit easier because it changes all of them at once. Then we've got optics. Now, this particular light, um, has the optics of zoom. It's a motorized zoom, of course, because it's a, a bigger moving head. If you see optics in here, maybe for an LED wash light, you may have the option, if the light has it, to insert different lenses. And, and if the light has that option, uh, you should see that here and be able to enter. And so that's really helpful as well, knowing that if you bring in a light and it's you know, by default, the 20 degree version, but you put on the 40 degree lens, you can totally do that right here. It's also going to tell you the weight um, and purpose you're allowed to enter as well. And so 
I'm just going to select these from uh, bottom to top so that my they're selected in order from left to right. And then I'm going to go right here on the cog, sequential patch. And this way it's going to patch them into my capture file so that when we do add a lighting console, um, if we do um, today, I'm not going to get super deep into the weeds on that. Um, we'll have DMX addresses for all these lights. And so right now it says unpatch. Um, and in capture, I actually can't go to the universes tab with this open, but the universes are generally um, A through Z and then the channels. And so if I just type one, it's going to put it at A.1, but I could change that to B.1, um, whatever, et cetera. All right. And so fixtures per channel, um, usually keep that at one. You can leave a channel offset between fixtures if you want. And then it's going to tell you how many channels are required and you can patch it. Awesome. And so let's go ahead. Actually, I'm going to launch Onyx quick just to have some data in because I, I know I mentioned that. You can control this with a console. So we'll just quickly show you the, the settings on that while we're here. Awesome. Very cool. Chris Chalk is here as well. Awesome, Crick. Chris, good eye, might, as they say. Good to have you here. So um, if we are controlling them from a console, we, we've got our patch right here, okay? And then we'll have it, it patched in our console as well. Um, in particular, I'm an Onyx. I'm just going to load the training file. And there are various ways to get your patch, uh, to get your data, rather, from your console to Onyx. And it's going to depend exactly on your setup and your hardware as to how you do this. Um, obviously, I have a completely different show patch here. And so we see some funkiness when this first comes up. Um, but regardless, um, what we see now is that Onyx launched up and it connected, okay? Um, and how you connect it is going to depend on your setup. In this setup, I'm on a computer, a PC, and I've got Onyx on the same PC as Capture. So I've gone ahead and I've enabled the, the KM test loopback interface or the Microsoft loopback interface as it's called. I've enabled that and I'm using that to, to send in Onyx, my SACN. I'm literally just, for those that use Onyx, we'll just go into the menu, go into Ether DMX under settings, SACN, turn it on, turn on the universes I want, set it to my Ether DMX interface, which is on the uh, network settings in interfaces page. And that's Ethernet 2, which is my Microsoft Loopback adapter. Um, it's a lot, it's a good bit simpler if you have a console or you have a second uh, computer connected, because then you'll just send out the network port of one computer from your console, you'll send out the data, and then you'll bring it in to capture using your built-in network port as well. I'm just going to close Onyx there. But what we can see then is right here where it, set, it says auto right now, it previously said um, SACN universe one, okay? And so that was letting me know, hey, um, I'm bringing in SACN from Onyx. You can bring in ArcNet. You can even bring in uh, NTEC USB, you know, MANet. There are other protocols as well um, and, and ways to set those up. Um, you can see a lot of them here in connectivity options. Um, there's, there's a lot of them. So we're not going to go over all of them, but that's the basic gist of connecting the two. Um, it's very dependent, you know, as to whether you're on the same PC and you use like a loopback adapter, or maybe you have a console, in which case you're going to use the PC's network port, et cetera. Um, so the, how you hook it up um, within network settings is going to depend a little bit on your exact setup. But once you get it connected, you, you're sending that data into the computer, you'll see it here under external universe in capture. And then you can choose, okay, SAC in universe one maybe is this one. Then universe two, you'll see SAC in universe two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And so that is some, some good info there as to how you basically manage all of that. Um, you can, you know, patch some universes as ArtNet, some as SACN. Um, you can even patch them out of order. If for some reason your universe A here in Capture 
uh, isn't exactly your universe in Onyx, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so um, while we're here, actually, um, I've got you know a couple things. There's a lot of great things to show you here, but I know we've gone over a bit so far. In fact, I see a question that just came in. Uh, what was the patch shortcut? Uh, and the patch shortcut was simply selecting all the lights, then going to this cog here, going to um, whoop, sequential, and then patch, hid from me for a second, at which point you see the patch window, you're able to use that. And so the other question, how do you link Onyx? Uh, as Matthias mentioned, uh, there will be more hopefully in the year with uh, linking Onyx and working directly inside it between that and capture. Um, he said that's something they're working on, but for now, you're going to be sending out your data from Onyx, probably SACN, that'd be my recommendation. It's just, it's a lighter um, protocol, tends to work better, et cetera. Um, but ArtNet is available as well. And so um, once we're here, okay, so we've got some lights in, we've worked with the basic texture, we've brought in some basic, uh, some, you know, basic forms and some truss, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so why don't we take a quick stretch break and, uh, you know, just see if you guys have any questions on what we've covered so far. So let me know uh, as to questions here, guys, um, as to that. Is there a plugin for Vectorworks? That was a question that just came in from Pat. Thanks for asking that, Pat. And uh, there is. It's not really a plugin. I mean, it's built in. Uh, but yeah, you can import uh, from Vectorworks. Absolutely. And so you can send the, uh, you basically send the DWG file from Vectorworks as well as the instrument data, data CSV. And, uh, and, and there, it's in the, the capture manual exactly what to do. Um, Joe Wiggins, can the student demo version work with Onyx? Um, it should. Yeah, it absolutely should. Um, you know, I haven't tried that directly, but it, it, it totally should just because you get full DMX control. And then with Onyx, you get four universes out. So there's no reason why those wouldn't work together. Uh, let me just double read over it. Yeah. Unlimited number of DMX universes. Yeah, should work just fine. Um, all console connectivity options are present and fully functional. Yeah, that should work fine, Joe. Um, SNL wrote, have noticed some fixtures are not oriented in the front position. Will this be corrected? Uh, yeah, it will. So what happened there, SNL, is just that I am... Um, I, I opened up a show file in, in Onyx, whatever I was using last, and it did not match this patch. It did not match this patch at all. And so that sent the lights in all kinds of funky directions, but we can fix that in a minute. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and we will fix that. Actually, we'll show you some tricks as to uh, turning lights on and working with them, etc. And then we see, uh, how about auto patch from Onyx? Maybe I think that's a um, more of a feature suggestion. And of course, um, those suggestions are always taken, probably not here. You can probably email Capture or the Obsidian team directly, but um, they do look at the chat afterwards, and so that'll definitely be in there as well. Uh -huh. Then, doo -doo -doo. okay, so guys, let me know um, if we have any more questions quick, and just take a minute actually to stretch. Uh, stretch, look away from your screen for a second, because uh, that's bad for your eyes to stare at a screen uh, all the time. So look at something at least 10 feet away. We're in here for the long haul. But hey, this is hour one. We've learned a lot already. It's, it's been good. So glad to have all 20,000 here of you today. And uh, so thankful for you guys coming. Awesome, guys. Very cool. Good. All right, guys. So with that said, this is going to be good. On to our next section here. So back here to capture. Um, oh, Jake the Snake. If you are adjusting a static par, how do you adjust the, the angle of it? Oh, we'll talk about that here in a second. Yeah, absolutely. I had originally, uh, you know, I'm kind of working from my outline here um, from when I've taught this before, but I'm, you know, for the webinar format, I'm kind of tweaking it a little bit as we go. So we'll definitely get there. Um, no worries there. Just leave that question in there. We'll be sure to get to it. Absolutely. And so we're here bringing in some lights. Um, and so let's go ahead. Sure, Jake the Snake asked, and Jake's been here on a, a good number of my webinars, I think. So great to have you, Jake the Snake. Love the name um, as well. Okay, one last question while we're here. 
SNL says, um, have added fixtures in Capture 2020, and when placing them versus real world, they aren't correct. Rather than check the visualizer versus real world, how can the front of the fixture be placed correctly? Um, so I think what you're saying here, SNL, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that when you bring in a light and then you start to move it in your console, when it moves forward in capture, it moves maybe backwards on your console, et cetera. Or maybe it could be turned sideways, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and what I always do, this is a little old school, but it's what I've always done in a visualizer, is, and with, you know, crews when I set things up, especially if I'm not familiar with the light, is I do the same thing in the virtual world that I would do in the real world, which is just say, okay, when I, paint, when I tilt forward, when I tilt to the positive direction, you know, I want the beams of the light to come upstage. That's generally what I do, okay? Um, and guys, I'm going to just keep going on for a minute, um, and uh, we'll keep talking as well. Um, so yeah, but uh, good questions here, guys. And so I just always verify, you know, with my console and capture, I don't think there's a better way to do it. Just, okay, when I tilt, when I go, you know, in the plus direction of tilt on this light, does it tilt towards my stage or away from my stage, right? Because for my front truss, I want that to tilt for my towards my stage. You know, my upstage truss, it's going to tilt upstage. Um, and that's the way I always orient all my movers, just so that they always start tilting the same direction when I tilt them in the positive on my console. And so when I bring them into capture, I just check that. Um, just the way I would with a light in the real world, right? It, you know, and so if it doesn't quite line up, what we can do here is you see we've got the, uh, the turning right here. And notice how I just picked up the outside of that turning um, deal. And so this, this turning, uh, you know, mechanism. And so basically if I go ahead and I grabbed the white portion of it, that turns, if I have all these lights selected, that turns all of them uh, together based on the center of that whole group. But if I go in this blank space on the outside, I actually turn the lights. And so it's really just as simple as being like, oh, they were backwards. Let me just turn them 180 degrees. Done. You know, and it's, it's really quick and simple to, to fix that. Absolutely. But another good reason why to use uh, presets or palettes in your programming on your console. So even if they didn't line up, you could update them real quick. Awesome. Awesome, guys. Cool. Very good. Awesome. Chris says, just before we get into it, is there an option similar to AutoCAD to select or deselect what you can snap to? Snap to objects, snap to grid, slash either. You know, Chris, I don't know. Um, and I'm not afraid to say that. Um, I'm trying to think. I've never tried to do that. Yeah, I don't know. That's one to look up or else our other moderators here might be able to check or pass something to the manual for you. Um, and so, yeah, I'm honestly not sure. So here, you know, because for example, I know I can do, yeah, when I move it here, I get the option to um, press escape basically to not snap or press shift to get the uh, orthogonal snacking, stack, snacking. <laughs> we are no snacking, um, but uh, we are not snacking, but, but I'm able to, to choose some options there. Um, but I'm not, I don't, know if I can set certain objects to, uh, to snap and certain to not. Um, and Nathaniel, yep, you guessed it right. To set them on the ground, we can just look in the side view, grab the turn, you know, like here I'm in the, the right view, grab the turn like that, whoop, and turn he does. Sideways, whatever, any crazy angle you come up with, um, your stage hands might hate you later. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, let's get back in here, guys real quick and uh, start working on some more fun stuff in here. So in this next segment, guys, we're going to bring in some conventional lights. We're going to work with lights and, um, you know, focusing them, using them without a console here. And we're also going to bring in some video elements and video projectors uh, to show you how that works. I know, you know, a lot of us are lighting people here, but we got to make the video people feel important. No, I mean, that's somewhat joking um, because obviously, you know, anybody that's paying attention knows that video is becoming uh, a bigger part of our show every single day, um, no matter what kind of show you do. And so that's what we're going to do, guys. Um, so let's go ahead, just for fun. And um, we see here, we had our DMX come in, okay? And these lights are all over the place. 
And so in our universes tab, there's actually a couple things we can see that are probably uh, really good to highlight at this time. Okay, so the very first thing is that when we select a universe, we see here, if, if things are patched to it, we see here the, um, I gotta watch my time too for that 90 minute point. <laughs> because I know some of you guys are on the demo and you'll get shut off after 90 minutes, which will be about, I think it was about 2030 after one. So that'll be a three-ish. Okay, good to know in my time zone. Um, so what we see here, guys, is um, we actually see our patch visually and there's some, some good stuff we can do with it, actually. Uh, one of the things is if the light wasn't patched, we can actually drag it into here. Oops. You can actually drag it, uh, I think, from the fixtures to the patch. Anyways, I don't ever do that, but I think it's there. Um, but what you can do here is you can drag these around in the patch, okay? And we also see right here, okay, we've got these values in here. And so these are the values coming from your console, right? I, I took Onyx and I closed it. Um, but here's where we would see those values come in from a console such as Onyx um, or any other console. And so you can see, okay, does my fixture line up like pan till? If you have issues, you can look at this. You can even press edit here, make it bigger. And you're able to move things around. You're able to see the values that are coming in and just make sure things line up. And this is a good place to diagnose. Um, maybe you accidentally had a different mode set or something similar to that. This is a good way to diagnose that just by looking, okay, you know, these channels are on, these ones are not, these ones should be on, etc. I can really give you a good glimpse into that as well. Um, it'll also show you if you accidentally patched in capture over top of lights, you know, they accidentally patched over top of each other, uh, you can see that there as well. So really useful window. I use it a fair amount, but we'll close that up right there. And I'm just going to go to more and reset external universe. Nope, that's not going to clear and that's okay. Um, no worries. And so what we can do now, guys, is actually walk you through um, really quick focusing these lights. Uh, and um, because this is gonna work the same whether we have a moving light or a conventional. And so let's go ahead and focus some moving lights first, kind of show you the controls for those. And then we'll patch some conventional lights and show you the controls for that as well. So let's go ahead and uh, select just all of these lights real quick. So we'll select them all. Notice I could select them here in any of the views with simple, uh, pretty typical, you know, pressing shift and clicking on different lights. I could go here in the fixtures tab and select them all. Um, pretty much anywhere you see the fixtures, you know, here in the patch as well. See, I just deselected one of them. You're, you're able to select and deselect things. It's, it's really nice that you can do it whichever way you want. And then if I'm in a live view here, in any of the live views, we're gonna see a power button symbol. And that's gonna be the fixture control. So I'm just gonna zoom out with my scroll wheel. And this is gonna bring up everything that the lights that you've got selected can do so that you can control them uh, without a console. So literally I can turn the lamps on, go ahead basically, um, because they were all, they all got some weird DMX values. I'm just gonna literally touch every parameter. And that's gonna open these things up going to open up the colors, going to open up the gobos, prisms. You can see here, there's you, anything the light can do, you can do here. Don't think any of them have colors. Iris, zoom, etc. You see they're all finding their way home. Looks like a couple of them have a gobo. Whoop. And so anything that the light can do, you're going to see here. And uh, that's really really good stuff. So we can bring in anything we want with this. And then we can also go ahead, bring in multiple gobos if we need to, bring in the prism, kick it out. Gobo rotation, I gotta go find that. Where that's hiding in here. Not a big deal otherwise. Whoop. But you can see here that you're able to control any parameter of the lights, including if we want to focus, we actually can go to a special focus mode here. Uh, under the uh, cog here, we go to focus or control U. And when we do that, 
anywhere we click, the lights are going to focus. And so this is actually really powerful. You can see here, just by clicking, boom, I've focused those lights. Maybe I go and I focus just one or two of them. Maybe just one of them. And then I can control you. I'm in focus mode. I can move that where I want. When I am done focusing, I can get myself out of that focus mode and be good to go. And so now that we've kind of seen a quick demo of, of focusing lights, I'm just going to go ahead and shut those guys off. And let's go ahead and bring in some conventional lights and talk about focusing them. Um, it primarily works the same way, but I want to show you a couple different options, especially if you work with a lot of conventionals. This is going to help you a lot. So we're going to go to library and let's see here. We can go to, I mean, we, we don't have to go to a true conventional, even something like a, a par will work great. So let's go ahead with the, uh, oh, which one do I want to go with today? You know what, let's go with that ADJ uh, Z par. Whoop. Z1000, I like that one a lot. It's a good light. Let me put the RGBW in. So now I'm just gonna bring in one of those. Boom. You know, maybe I clone it, maybe I don't. I'll just clone a couple. Like nine, why not? Drag it in real good, put it on an imaginary truss, which is up here somewhere. Let's actually just go to our front view, bring them out front. So now we wanna focus these guys. And so there's a few ways that we can do that. Just for the sake of visualization, I'm going to turn them on, give them a color. And then we're gonna point them. And so we can literally go, and we can go with uh, control U here, focus, right? Which was the same as uh, hitting the cog and going to focus. And we can then press to focus and that's gonna focus them, okay? Might do what you want, might not. Obviously we're pinpointing a spot with them all, but we can also go ahead and just move them around. And so moving them around with the move tool is gonna do that same thing. Where we're able to go from the top view if we need to, Oops, grab the end of that from the top view. Of course, we can do it as a group or individually. We can move that light around from the top, then from the side, and be able to focus that wherever we need to. Of course, using the control uh, U, that focus option is definitely quicker. Uh, but either way works, and, and they modify the same thing. Maybe you get it just about right, and you say, oh, I just kind of adjust it on the top a little bit. Done, you know? Totally. Um, does right click auto focus the light as well? Uh, yeah, yeah, so it is a right click when you're in there. Let me just double check that. Is it, a, yeah, right click works, yep, absolutely. Right click or left click does work. Boom, so learn something new every day, absolutely. And so uh, it's really just as simple with conventionals, you can do that same kind of stuff. Uh, with the conventional light as well, if you've got a filter, in here, I don't know if it'll let me do it with an LED. You can just go find a filter, drag it onto the light. It's not working because the fixture can't take it, but that's okay. Uh -huh. Something you can do as well. Now, um, let's see here. Looking at my notes here, don't wanna miss anything. And so now we've gone ahead, uh, we can, Patch these lights again, just to show you guys patch once again. Whoop. We're able to go in here, find the fixtures, find our pars. There they are. We can go ahead and sequential patch. Um, we also have, you noticed before we, we went into patch, we also have the option to do channels and circuits and all of that will show up in all the paperwork within Capture. Uh, which you can print all of that to give to the crew when you're setting up the show. So all of that is very important stuff that you want to be aware of. Sometimes you'll use it, you know, some people might not. So we'll patch these guys now. Press patch. 
Yeah, Bud's asking since we were just focusing. That's a great question. Uh, if I'm driving pan and tilt with my console and I adjust the moving light focus and capture, will it adjust pan tilt values on your console? Uh, no, it will not. I don't think any consoles do that in capture. Maybe there's two way for one one or two consoles. I can't remember off the top there, of my head. There are a few consoles that oh. can link. Um, ETC EOS is one of them. Um, Hog will do that as well as I believe uh, Campsys. Awesome. And, you know, with Matthias saying other things will come to Onyx before the end of the year, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we see it. I don't know anything. I'm just, just noting that. Um, and so right now it doesn't. Um, basically, when you've got DMX coming in for a certain universe, for certain light, and those lights are on that universe, you can't actually move it. Um, the console just takes over. And so um, that's how that works. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, yeah, the next Onyx. Oh, no. Yep. Awesome. Good. So, going ahead now, back to the notes here. Um, let's talk quickly about textures and video elements. And so, as we mentioned before, you know, you're building your stage, you're, you're looking at different things here, and you're able to go ahead and create um, a lot of different looks besides just gray walls. And so, I just want to walk through some of that, particularly if I press on, say, this wall here, go to materials, and actually it doesn't matter if I press on that wall or not, but I can go to gray dim mat here, and then if I need to, I can actually bring in an image, just double clicking there on texture image. Maybe I grab this fine elation logo, and uh, we can add an image in for any texture, so it could be something you have a picture of, whatever, um, as well as in the library under materials. There are some like wood here, metals. There's a lot of different textures in here that might be what you need. And then once you drag that in, as you can see here, we've got a texture width and height. So we're able to set that um, depending on how big we want that logo to be. We can also go ahead and uh, press on the cog and go to map material. And that's going to allow us basically we see here we've kind of got a box, which is like the size of the material. We can actually move that guy around and map that to our canvas. Let me hide that there. No, but if you don't like what it's doing, if you just make ugly things like me, then probably the best thing to do is to line it back up. Use the out the door button, and then you can just remap the texture width here. You know, maybe it's going to be 50 feet by 50 feet. And then we see the Elation logo nice and upside down, 50 feet by 50 feet, etc. And so we're able to go ahead there and, uh, you know, do a lot of things with it. Like I mentioned, that illuminance, transparency, well, make it nice and transparent or not, tinting it, different, basically, applying that color to it. We we'll go ahead and modify the color as well as needed. And so there's a lot in materials here. Um, this is just scratching the surface, but as we went before in materials, once you've got a material built, when you, when you do want to apply it to an object, it's really just as simple as dragging it onto that object. And then it's going to overwrite whatever was there. Just like that. Done. Take that one back. Nice and easy. Awesome. So let's talk for a minute now that we're in materials here. Let's talk about video elements. And so video elements will, um, <laughs> we'll see Bob's releasing information. It's all good. Um, video elements allow you to put video onto surfaces, which can be really helpful. Uh, you can put video on a surface as um, as if it were an LED wall or a monitor. Um, and there's really two ways to do this. And with video becoming more and more a part of what we're doing every day in, in visualization, um, I think it's important to do that here. So um, video can be done two ways, as I mentioned. In the library, if we go ahead, for example, we can find under fixtures various video walls. Like here, you know, Absent is a good example. It's under A, and there's a lot of them. Um, or We'll go to Elation and we'll find something nice as well. 
let's go ahead, go to elation, and then we go find a nice video wall. Just scroll down till we see these guys. You have the E series. And the benefit of using a video wall over just texturing a surface is that the video wall is going to have brightness information built into it. And it's also going to have the pixel pitch built into it. And so it's going to look more realistic. Now, if you want, you can just apply video to surfaces and I'll show you how to do that as well. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead here. I'm just going to go actually here and make this one a front view. Control two. Actually a right view. There we go. And then I'm going to go ahead and drag one of these video tiles in. Nope. I do want the front view. Turn it real quick. Place it somewhere so we can see just, you know, a little better. We've turned it 90. Drag it in behind the truss in a very normal place. At which point we can clone that guy. And it is, let's see, before we clone it, we'll look at the size info on it. And under the design tab, we'll go to selected items. And we can see it's one foot 10.7. What is that size wise? Who knows? And so instead, of, since it's an odd size, I thought it would be a meter by a meter. We'll just go ahead and from the top view here, just clone it. More or less, do nine clones. They're going to be three feet apart. And so now there's a gap in between them, but this uh, can show you that <laughs> in thinking of beta versions of Onyx that aren't out, um, you know, people get mad when they download versions that don't work right or they find bugs. But you can see here, we could just start to drag them together and they will latch, just like in the real world. It's not quite the same, but allows you to link those different panels together. So that's kind of the opposite of, obviously it's much slower than finding the right size and cloning it. But maybe we're doing something artistic with our video wall and get these panels separated. And so then we can go ahead and uh, maybe we drag them all and we clone this time instead of in the Z direction and the Y. We'll do another three foot grid. It's gonna be the funkiest design ever. And we get this design, kind of like that old, old Windows logo actually. And uh, <laughs> and once we've got all our tiles and we've got them selected, we can go ahead and map some video to them because uh, that should be our next step. So under media is where we're going to first, very first thing we're going to do is bring in our video file that we're going to use uh, for our show. And so right here, video players is what we want. Um, we can also do video capture if we're sending a live video stream from a media server. But under video and players, we'll press add. And then we get some options here. None of these are set in stone. Um, we can set the output resolution to whatever we need to here in various formats. We can set the patch if we want to patch it as something that we start and stop from our lighting console. And then we can press add video file. Go find something nice. I downloaded this one. It was Creative Commons licensed uh, from this Beeple website. It's good for example, but always make sure you license to do whatever you're doing before you use it on a show. And then I can play it here. And playing just shows that file playing. Perfect. It's kind of a funky coins dropping file. And then, <laughs> yeah, Chuck doesn't want to have to deal with, uh, in the chat, he doesn't want to have to deal with with people complaining about stuff not working right. That's always bad. And so that's why beta versions have got to be almost right before they're released. But anyways, so now we've got our video brought in, at which point we can go to, go to our selected items. And then we have the option for boom, material um, here. Scroll down, scroll down. There it is. All right. And so it's got all sorts of options in here. These are definitely worth exploring because they change for per type of thing. Uh, whether it's people, there's different options for their height when you bring them in. For lights, there's different options. Here we're able to adjust the 
the you we can see here the different uh, pixel pitch and all that info here. But for now, we're just going to go to material and uh, we'll go to a new material now. So under the design tab, materials, add new, just call it video. Go ahead and do texture media, select our video player, at which point we can select our texture width and height. But first, I'm just going to drag it, literally drag my texture again, my material, onto the, the units. At which point we can select our width and height. Of course, this thing's real, real darn bright. But we can adjust that. And so here you can totally adjust the size as needed. Maybe we make it just nasty blown up or 20 by 20 feet. And we're able to see that video play across nice and simple. Uh, if you're not using a video wall or you, you're not sure which wall it's going to be yet, you could do the same thing, same material. I'm just going to drag this out of the way a little bit. And you could use the material and just drag it to any other surface. Just like with the logo that we were looking at before, we can totally go ahead, map material using the cog. We're able to change that material map, move things around, exit, or just get out of that. We can also, uh, if you do need to map the material to multiple surfaces at the same time, like with a projection map setup, then you can go ahead and select those multiple items at the same time. And then you can bring your material on it together. And we can see, we can assign to the common ones either way or assign to all. So it gives us some different options there. Definitely something uh, worth exploring more as you work inside of Capture. Awesome. Actually, good point now, just to, to go in here and mention a couple other things. In the library tab, uh, you can, besides just having this strange stage with a lot of random weird stuff on it, you can bring in people and other things. And actually, this is a great point to uh, close and reload as the demo show, okay? Um, is there a way to make it all one video? Yes, there is, um, Paul and uh, other folks. Actually, it might be a good time to stop for questions. Okay. So let's stop for questions here, um, just because we see some coming in. So if you have a question right now, uh, we're going to bring those in. Answer those here. I see a couple coming in. Awesome. And so that's what we're going to do. Back over to Capture here. Let's so grab a quick sip of tea. All right, so back to capture. And so we've got, first question I saw in the chat here was, uh, was is there a way to make it all video? It's splitting to a bunch of smaller screens. Yeah, absolutely. You just literally go in your uh, texture here in design tab and set that width and height accordingly. So I think that this, this big backdrop, I think it was 100 feet by 100 feet. And so I would set that accordingly. And now we see it's basically just one video screen at that point. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so questions, is it possible to send a Resolume output as a video source for the wall? So yeah, absolutely. You can bring in live video sources. That's what we do here in video captures. If we press add, I'll just show you because this answers multiple questions. Then select device. Um, so I can bring in my webcam, but it can also take in uh, various video streams as well. Um, before I say anything that's false, I'm just going to double check it in the manual as to exactly which ones are available and which ones are not, because you don't want to give people bad answers, for sure. Awesome. So how did I add the media player? Um, yeah, so just like, just like uh, you see here, we just went to media, video players, add. We press that, we set the resolution and such, gave it a name, boom, we've got that. You can change this stuff too, as long as you, uh, I think you have to stop the video, but you can pull up the settings. No, you don't have to stop the video. You can change that resolution as needed, restart that video. Of course, sometimes uh, if your computer starts to run out of steam, just drop that resolution way down 
and you can still visualize at full speed. Um, absolutely. So various questions here about Resolume, which I have not used with Capture. So I'm going to double check. So yeah, NDI is totally um, available. Um, let's see. I wonder if you can set Capture or set Resolume to do NDI. You, you should be able to, um, at which point you could bring it in as an NDI type signal. That's generally the best way to, to send video across computers, right? It's awesome. Let's just Google it. Resolume NDI, you know, it's one of the top things you go, people Google. So yeah, you can do, uh, you can do, awesome, you can do NDI outputs from Resolume. So you would set that up. Uh, and then as long as you've got the computer's network together, you should be able to add in that video stream here and I'd be able to, to find it and select it. That should be no problem, absolutely. Very cool. So that answers those couple questions that came up about video and media. Uh, let me know, guys, if there's any other questions about other things that, that we've uh, talked about so far. Uh, what video formats does Capture support? Um, a lot of them. That's a good question. Off the top of my head, um, I don't think, I've, I usually only put MP4s in it, and I've never had a problem with them. And so if Bob wants to pop in and say something else, he can. If not, that's fine. Um, see if it says here. Yeah, so it says here video and image files, uh, M4A, M4V, .move, MP4, AVI, and then as well image files, JPEG, and PNG. And so those appear to be the options as well as, of course, the live video. So should be lots of options there. Plots we'll get to in a couple minutes, guys. We're headed in that direction. So I'm going to leave that question up there from owner, whoever owner is. So glad to have you here today. Awesome. I'll just make sure at this point there aren't other questions, and then we'll kind of hit uh, the third section of our webinar. Can media files through a media player be used in conjunction with a high-end DL2? Boy, now we're just asking the stump the professor questions. Um, should be doable. Actually, it is. And let me show you, Chuck, really quick um, how to do that. So one thing I didn't harp on, which we can totally show here, is projectors, okay? And so let's just bring in a DL2. I've never used one on, in Capture, but I've used projectors, and so I bet it works the same way. So I'm just going to scroll down because searching wasn't getting there for me. To H, 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 H. It's always good to learn new things. Find a DL2, bring it in. Find where in the world I dropped it. And so that's now showing a test pattern. And so now I just need to assign the media to it. So if I go to selected items, let's see, throw, yeah, display test card, no, and then media right here, I choose my video player. And uh, oh, it is well known. No, it is uh, noting as well, Chuck Drew, that should answer your question there, uh, that the video players can have multiple pieces of, midi, of video. Video. Video is not a thing. Video. So I can add more files on top of this. Like if I add all these lovely pictures, um, I can start to add in those different files. And that's where patching these as DMX control can make a lot of sense because you can change these um, from DMX control between those different files. And so now you see we've got the DL2, we've sent it media through capture, could even be through an, an NDI stream, um, at which point you are able to, uh, to go ahead and, uh, and play that, assign that media to that DL2 through the selected items, once you get it selected, through media. And then you should be good there, absolutely. See, we got that, wasn't as hard as we thought. That's one of the great things. Um, so yeah, a couple questions about map uh, to extents and, and mapping uh, to video mapping basically uh, through capture. So remember it's a pre-visualization tool, but we certainly can map our, the video we're doing to objects, just as an example here. We'll run through that since we got time. It's always fun doing a webinar, you know, in a new format for the first time. Um, Having not done a three-hour 
you know, basics webinar before, it was kind of like, well, I knew about how much I can fit into this, but we're doing really good on time today. I did not mean to create nine of those. So I'll just create a bunch of boxes because boxes are easy, boxes are cool. Maybe we create three of them. We drag them around to different places. We select them. We can then go ahead and apply our material to them. And this is like the craziest flashy show ever. Um, so we'll go down here to materials, go ahead to our video, drag that on all three of them. Um, by default, it's basically mapped in at the size. And let me just go ahead and make some of these stop because they're getting a little, little, little crazy. Whoop. Sure, why not? Okay, so now we see between these boxes here, we actually have that material assigned. And then we're able to go ahead as well and customize that further. Just by pressing the cog here, pressing map material, and then we see, especially if we look at this front view, it's a good view, uh, as well as the, the top. It's gonna show us how that mapping is being done to this object, okay? Absolutely. So we're able to go ahead and literally just change that sizing. You see, I, I've totally moved this canvas. It's not even on these boxes. Then, whoops, move it back on. Hope I just lost it because I dropped it there. That's okay. I can just grab my three boxes again. Cog, map material. Okay, now we're back. Go ahead and find it again. Maybe I scale it way down so I can actually see what's going on. But then I drop it again. Anyways, you get the idea. We can totally map that material there. Totally can scale it down. And we see it mapping accordingly across that unit in uh, the 3D space. And so, yeah, that's the basics of video mapping. Again, this is kind of a basic uh, connection here. But that should answer those couple questions. Awesome. Um, now I'm seeing a couple questions coming through for stuff we haven't answered yet. So I'm just going to leave those in the queue, um, the question section, so that we can go ahead and address those um, at the end of today's webinar, when we've got some time, because I want to make sure to cover the rest of the stuff we mean to, to cover, um, then get back and answer any additional questions. So take a minute, guys, as we have been with these questions segment, uh, stretch for a minute. I'm going to stand up real quick, because sitting for three hours on a screen is not my cup of tea. Awesome. So I'm going to go ahead quick. I know we went over it a little bit earlier and talk about setting up a DMX input and just kind of walk through the setting up of a console. And knowing that at this point too, if people were on the demo version, um, that they've had to close their, their program. So I'm just going to save real quick this lovely masterpiece, um, that it's not, um, and close it. And I'm going to go ahead and open up a new file. I don't even have to close really, but just in case if you were in demo version, you can close because you'd have to and then reopen this guy. Um, it's, it's worth noting too, if you upgrade capture, um, all the old versions stay on your computer, which can be helpful if you need to open a file from a colleague that's in an older version and work on it. You can totally open those versions if you owned them. And so now I'm gonna open up that club file. Um, I had it open before, but you can just go to open project. Hopefully you downloaded it. I believe it downloads a zip file. You can unzip it. You find this club file inside. And then you're able to go ahead and open this file so we can see some different things. Um, so let's walk through first and foremost, actually patching a show in a console and then seeing it in capture. And here we have the lovely studio colors and techno beams and studio spots, such lovely fixtures um, that I don't miss. And so now I'm gonna open up Onyx as well. And I just wanna walk through basically the simple patching of a show real quick to show you guys how this would work together and then visualize. And so it'll be real quick, of course, being that uh, 
This is the Elation channel. We're here doing it in Onyx, glad to do so. So I'm actually going to pop my patch out oops, and throw it on the other screen so that I can look at it, but you guys can then see what I'm doing. I'll just create a new show. Name it. Of course, if you do want to learn more about Onyx, if you haven't used it before and you're checking it out here, you're like, oh, that looks cool. Uh, we are doing the Onyx 101 webinar every other week, basically. Um, so this week, right in this time slot is Capture. Next week, it should be a couple hours earlier. Usually we start um, an hour earlier. It would be, um, it will be the Onyx 101 webinar. On Thursdays, there's an advance. And on Tuesdays, there is a Netron webinar with uh, Matthias as well. And so all good webinars. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and patch some lights here. Um, someone's asking, can I give us the Onyx show file too? Like of this that I'm patching now? I mean, I guess so. Um, I'm just literally patching this from scratch. You can follow along. I'm not going to do much in it. Um, and so, yeah, but I'm just going to go to studio colors. So we'll go to H. I love these demo shows because they use like super old lights. G H. Oh, you know, we're just going to search it. Boom. Love the studio colors. But they are so woefully outdated. Can patch 10 of those. And starting those at one. Yep. Apply a patch. Then we go ahead and do techno beams. Yeah. So it's really as simple as just coming in, going ahead, full mode. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight of those guys. Then studio spots, one, two, three, four, five, five. Is it really five? One, two, three, four, five, it is, all right. Not a big center fixture guy myself, but that's okay. I'll go ahead and patch those guys and then we'll just patch quickly. Let's see. We're in standard mode, which is 24 channel. Oh, zoom versus frost is just whether it was the ones with zoom in it, I think. That's right. I remember that. And then I just want to patch some front light. Or are those on a separate universe? No, they're all here. And so then we've got conventionals basically starting at 425. There are one, two, three, four. There's like 10 or something like that. So we'll just go ahead to new fixture. Um, I guess we can potentially have the Onyx show file afterwards. I know that question keeps coming through. I mean, I can save it. I'm just really going to patch things. I'm not going to really go into depth at all. So if you're not really getting any programming, um, but there's no reason why that can't be shared. Assuming the fine folks putting on this webinar are good with that because it's their webinar. Boop. So I'm just going to do, there's not that many channels. There's 88 channels free in the universe. I'm going to do 88. Fill that up. Awesome. So in Onyx, as I showed earlier, we're going to go ahead and bring, first of all, our patch back into here. Bring our screen back into capture. Um, and we see we've got external universe searching. And we've got three SACN universes that, that I could set up. I'm only using universe one. So when I connect that up, we see, okay, everything went dark in this demo file. That's generally a good sign. And when we see here that all the lights are off, we're good with that. So then if I pull up Onyx, I can start to bring some lights on like these studio colors, and we see, okay, they're on, good. Maybe I go ahead and I minimize this a little. Whoops, nope, minimize. And I start to move these around. So you can see here that we're visualizing. And so that's the basics of, of setting them up. It really is as simple, depending on your network setup. Again, you know, how you set the console up through um, 
sending SACN or sending ARDNET is going to depend or sending using the EOS link or the MA link or the hog link. Um, you know, all of those are going to depend specifically on your specific console setup. So be sure to look to the manual for those. Um, they're all pretty well described, very well described actually in the manual. So I wouldn't want you to miss out on that. Um, but I'm just going to go ahead and I guess leave these on for a minute. No, sure, why not? And give you a little bit of a demo here of the club. So now I'm going to close Onyx just so that it's easier to be just in capture. Reset my universes real quick. Awesome. And so, yeah, you know, setting up your console with it, thankfully, I know we've had a lot of questions about that, is actually a really simple process. Real easy. Now there's no universe connected. And so I could totally go ahead, um, just explore this file, et cetera. Ooh, questions are going away. I love that. So, for example, we can go in any of the views, and this is a good right here. This is a good um, a good showing of the wireframe view, the uh, or not the wireframe, it's called the uh, the plot view, which you can customize. Um, there's also the custom view, which is kind of a mix of everything. A lot of good stuff in here. Let's put that back to plot view. No, I like wireframe a lot myself. Um, and so we can see there's a lot going on in this club, which makes it really a good show to play with and a good show uh, to work with. Um, just looking at my notes, if there's any recommendation I could give you, if you ever have issues connecting your console up with Capture, I always recommend sending the data from your console first, then opening Capture. As you can see here from what I just did, it's not 100% required, but it's just one of those one of those things um, that would be, you know, easier um, once in a while if there's if there's for some reason, if it's not syncing up, sometimes a restart of capture helps it get real happy. Um, it's probably a, a funky network setting or something, but totally, totally doable. So let's go ahead now and uh, look at some cameras and views, okay? So we've done a lot in here of just moving around and um, playing with the camera and all that, but what happens if you wanna save some of these views? Well. I showed already going control one, two, three, four. Um, I believe on Mac it's command or Apple. Um, but we can also save views on five through nine, as you can see here. Okay. And so what we're able to do is we can go five, control six, seven, eight, nine. You see, if I press them, nothing happened. But we can totally save there. And so if we start to find views that we like, it's just as simple as going store camera and then position one through five is basically control five through control nine. So I could store that and go to my next one maybe. Go ahead and store that. And then we see I've got those on control five, control six. Very helpful. Um, another thing people ask it a lot about is a uh, haze. Uh, Hayes changed a few years ago in Capture, and it's really easy now. The easiest way to find it is just to find it here and click on it, um, the little cloud here of Hayes. And basically for Atmosphere, Capture has what they call um, Atmosphere boxes. And when you select those boxes, you're able to go ahead and you're able to go to selected items and then be able to change anything about the Hayes itself. And so you can see here, like there's a speed here, you know, how quick is that stuff moving across the air? If I crank it up, it moves really fast. Um, we can set the size of the box. By default, it goes auto, just based on the biggest items within your, your file. Um, you can set the density variation and edge softness. And so really, you know, if you're like, okay, I wanna make a really terrible old hazer smoky look, you can do that. Um, you know, you can start to crank up the density and then take the edge softness way down and give it some more variation. And you get kind of a smoky, kind of uneven hazer, especially if you speed up the speed. Uh, maybe you go, oh no, I want to do the, the nice hazer, you know, one of those MDGs or something. And I just want it to be really light. You can totally adjust that to whatever it would look like in your venue. 
you know, take that variation. Oh, it's the perfect haze that nobody's ever had. Beautiful. So there's a lot you can do there as well with, uh, with haze uh, while we're here. Uh, let's talk quickly about uh, filters and scenes and plots, okay? Basically, the rest of the stuff in this design tab is, is on my list to hit here. Um, and I know we've had some questions about those, and so it's definitely good to hit them all. So if I go here to, um, to filters, you're able to go ahead, and this is pretty cool, and have these different filters where you can show and hide layers in your different scenes, okay? Um, and so you can see here, like here's lighting only, and it hides the audio stuff, and then stage um, has the audio stuff in it, but no lighting. Um, and the way that these filters work is you're able to just go ahead and uh, select things up. Have a drink, David, oh, my voice is sounding bad. Well, that's what happens when you talk for a couple hours in a row. Uh, but I'll take a drink of my beverage. Uh, you're able to go ahead. You can actually trigger these from DMX control as well. Um, and then you can go ahead and apply them to views under more. You can apply them to all views. Or uh, you should be able to drag them in. Yeah, I usually apply to all views. But you can totally drag in these different filters, which is just a cool way. Instead of hiding layers individually, especially if you've got a lot of layers, um, like if you've come from um, different you know, from a CAD program and you've got like a billion layers with your facilities, you know, various layers on them, uh, you can use a filter to, to hide those things. So more clear all view filters can get rid of that as well. Great question that came in actually. How do you hide the camera in Haze? Because uh, you see the little camera hiding up here. And so in any of the views, real simple, you just go here to this little uh, menu and then um, you want to go to widgets, control shift W hides those guys. So you still have the hazer in the air, but you hide the, the little friendly cloud um, because ultimately your clients don't want to see the friendly cloud. Uh, you can delete. I just deleted the hazer and the haze goes away, um, but I'm going to bring him back with control Z. So that's available in there as well too. Very important stuff. Um, so as we go down here, yeah, we did filters. Filters are great, um, especially if you've got a lot of layers. We are able to make fixture groups, pretty simple. Just selecting a couple fixtures, add group. It's much like you might think um, adding a fixture group would be, you know, very simple there. Um, there's, there's a fair amount you can do in here, um, including you can update a fixture group. So if you selected something new, more update. Now we've added that new fixture in. We could clone that group, then maybe add another fixture into it, press update. All those capabilities are available in there. Absolutely. Uh, let's see. Next we've got, let's get the notes. Next we've got scenes. Um, scenes are interesting because they, what's the best way to explain this? They allow you to basically build kind of like the filters um, different scenes that you can toggle between. So different views, different selections, et cetera, et cetera. And so they allow you to, to pop through those. Um, truth be told, it's not something I use a ton, but DMX control on those is great because it is patchable. And then you can control that with your lighting consoles. Um, but plots are something we've gotten a good number of questions about. So I want to hit that here. If we go to plots here, and there is a plot built in this one called stage overview, we're able to go ahead and create plots. And so by default in the plots tab, if there's nothing here, like you're starting your own file, then let's go ahead and press add. Okay, we now get a new plot. Now we can go ahead into edit mode. We get this nice full screen, okay? We can then go ahead and change the size, whatever else we need to do. We can also go ahead And we'll start to, um, to, 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 oh, where is it? Oh, I'm having a mind blank quick to bring in stuff in. That's okay. Um, but we've got a lot of questions about the plot. And so I definitely recommend using the plot editor. Popping that guy into edit mode.
and then uh, you're able to bring things in. If I go into edit mode, for example, on this pre-created plot, you're able to see here, there are a lot of options in here. So we've got a orthographic top view basically already in here. And we're able to just go in there, move it around as needed. Um, we can resize the zoom on it as needed. We can go ahead, we can copy it. We need to delete it, resize it this way, resize it that way. The cool thing about the plots here is you're really able to, to set them up however you want, being that title block and um, all these other options are in here. And you're able to set those up, export them to PDF, print them, whatever you need to do, etc. And so printing the plot, if you've got a plot set, is just as simple as pressing print, sending it to a printer, or print to P export to PDF, uh, if maybe you're going to a different one. Thank you, Kenneth. I'm sorry that I totally forgot that. Insert view, that's what it is. You can tell I don't do a lot of plots in Capture. Um, but yeah, so go into plot to editor. Thank you, Kenneth. Right click, insert view. Um, that brings in the view. Then I knew it was simple. Then you could insert, uh, say you go ahead and make a nice header block. Put that there. You can bring in images, text, the symbols, obviously, for all the lights that are in your show. And you can create pretty much as many of these as you want. I don't think there's a limit on them. So you can do front views, side views. You can do ones that are at regular page size, ones that are plot size, et cetera, et cetera. So many options. So many good things you can do. Awesome. And so that's the basics of plots. There also are plot styles, which just allow you to have different basically print style, styles for those lights. And so whether you include certain information, like patch numbers, channel, wattage, etc. For some plots, you might want to include all of that. For some, you might want to include some of it. You can turn that on and all, all on and off here. It's one of those things that, uh, you know, you've got all the options here. You might touch them, you might not, but you've got the ability to work with them if you would need them. Awesome. Very cool. So back to the notes here, just whoop, get back on setting. Ah, yes, after plots, I wanted to talk about the rendering settings because um, I know that's a question that comes up a lot. And so we're doing great on time here, which is cool too. Um, so we'll have a, a good amount of time for questions here. But uh, if you find yourself, you know, your computer is getting sluggish, you're not able to keep up the frame rate that you want, etc. You may want to work with those visualization settings. One of the things that I like to do is... Um, or reports, yeah, I'll hit reports in a minute. Put that in my notes. Um, one of the things I like to do is uh, just go to design, go to the views tab, and then rendering settings, and turn on that quality information. I showed you that before. And that just on any live tab shows you the quality that it's running at. Um, there are a few different rendering settings. They're a lot simpler than they used to be, which is awesome. Um, for most cases, most of the time, the automatic balance is gonna work great for you. Automatic and balance basically just uses whatever logic they built into the software to try to get you a really good frame rate, you know, keep the, the thing moving at real time while giving you the most quality possible. Because as you're visualizing, especially if you're pushing the limits of your computer, uh, there will be times when all the lights are on and strobing and moving that it's really working hard. And then there might be times where it ups the quality a little because things aren't moving around as much. So automatic is really good. Um, as you can see, there's three automatic modes, which are great. You can kind of push it to be a little more quality focused, push it to be a little more performance focused, um, as well as the old uh, rendering settings of ultra high, medium, low, and minimal, just to show you minimal there. Um, they all just, you know, it's just kind of a, a scale where as you go along it, it gets better and better. But truth be told, they all look good from compared to the older versions of Capture. They look amazing. Um, and so you're able to change those there as well. On top of that, 
within each view, you're able to customize some different camera settings. And this is uh, pretty cool stuff. So we're in the alpha view here. And just like if you were looking through a real camera, the visualizer's camera basically works the same way. So we've got the um, actual vertical field of view so you could literally make it like more fish-eyed or default 45, it only goes up to 90. But you can make that field of view um, different, make that lensing different on the camera. You can also go ahead and change the white balance. By default, it's at 6,500K, but maybe you wanna show your client how you'd balance the cameras down to tungsten, and then you'd see how blue these moving lights are, right? So let's put that back at 6,500. We also get things like hue clamp. Uh, hue clamp's actually a pretty good control if you're working with pixels. It's basically kind of a setting where in its 25% state, it's realistic, but you can see pixels better if you turn it all the way down. And then you kind of see the, the um, clipping of the light, the bright light, if you take it all the way up, you see that clipping more apparent. Again, all of these settings are things you can work with. The bloom is kind of similar. It's just kind of this, this halo that you get on things. Um, so depending on how you want it to look, you know, that's not realistic, but you can do it depending on the look you're going for. Um, there are, somebody asked about lasers earlier, and you totally can do lasers. There's a few ways to do lasers. Um, I've personally used the uh, X-Laser uh, plugin that they, they have called Accelerate, which allows you to bring them in basically as media, and it looks really cool. Um, you're totally able to, uh, to do that as well. And you can set here whether they flicker or not. The ambient light level, we talked about that earlier, but you can set basically the, you know, quote, house lighting of the, the world. It's basically, I mean, it's the sun, you know, if there was, if there was a sun that was everywhere in every space that just kind of lit things up. Uh, you can change the color of that too, which is cool. Make it purple, whatever you want. And then here as well, guys, um, you're able to go ahead and set some different parameters about patching these views, etc., etc. Now, great question came in about reports. Um, so reports are a really cool um, thing you can use here that I skipped over, I jumped to plots, went right over it, that allow you to just build what it sounds like, spreadsheets of the gear in your show, the channels they're on, where they go, et cetera. So that you can take the design that you've built in Capture and basically export you know, reports, as they're called, for your master electrician. And they're really simple. So we just go to reports, press add, and then we've got these pre-built reports, equipment, rigging point, fixture, groups, locations, frame lists. Say we do frame lists for this one. Nope, let's go ahead and do, well, that's for like a follow spots, I think. We'll just do the uh, equipment report. I know there's already one. And then we can go ahead and edit that. So when we do do that, the edit comes up and there's a lot in here where we're able to adjust the individual tables. And we can change some formatting stuff, et cetera, et cetera. You can then delete things at will, change you know, the various um, words that are in there, and really customize these things to your needs. When you're ready to print them, totally go ahead. Uh, like for example, you see here we can sort all sorts of different ways. Set your different columns. So you've got the number column, the type, weight, rating. Maybe you don't need the weight. You can just delete that out of there. Boom. Then you can go ahead and save that guy. Export it, either as an HTML file or just straight up print it. Of course, you can always print to PDF if you need a PDF or otherwise. So that's all good stuff in there. Uh, frame lists, as we mentioned before, are the color lists. So here there's 33 colors in this show and it shows you how many of each, what the colors all are. So that's helpful if you're cutting gel. Again, something we do less and less, but I know folks in the theater world and the, the film and television world are definitely still using gel. It's definitely still a, a thing that goes on. 
It's not dead yet. Um, and so, yeah, at this point, guys, let's take your questions and go down whatever uh, rabbit holes you guys want. Because I've definitely, I've given you guys at this point a, a really good overview. Remember to ask the questions in the questions space. We've given you guys a really great overview just of all the basics, but there's a number of places where we could definitely go deeper. Um, I didn't want to, you know, schedule us to do too much during today's webinar. Um, and so feel free to ask those questions. Um, no Mendoza asks, without a console, is it possible to make some scenes and cues and, and trigger them? And uh, yeah, you can save cues, absolutely. Uh, so let me grab a, a drink here before I lose my voice. Absolutely, a little bit more. Thank you all for coming as well today, guys. Um, and so, uh, scenes, no, not scenes. Yeah. Yeah, scenes are what we want, I believe, for those. Truth be told, it's not something I use a lot. I usually just program it into the console and save it. Ah, yes, focus plane is actually a great place to go. That's right, we forgot about the focus plane, but that's new. Okay, good, we've got some good stuff happening in here. Ah, good, all right, cool. Got some good questions here. Um, so the first, can you show the focus plane? Absolutely. So the focus plane, I, I mentioned it earlier, but I forgot to show it, is um, a tool that allows you to see basically hot spots of light in a certain space. And so we can go to the uh, library tab, to the built-in, and then do focus plane to add it. And say I just drag it into a front view here. And maybe it's on my floor. So I'm just gonna line this up with the floor really good, more or less. Awesome. And then go overhead and line it up. So it's looking good. And so at that point, we've got our focus plan plan, our focused plane, and in any live view, we can see some data on it. So by default, it's just showing us this grid, but we can see an actual kind of light reflection. You know, it's kind of like it shows us basically the beam of lights and then the heat map, what everybody's looking for. So if I look at that overhead, you can actually see the brightness of the lights. And then I can filter that even further. If I go to the uh, Design tab, the selected items. We can see here the heat map minimum and maximum in Lux. And so you're able to set basically, you know, a good um, kind of parameter as to, you know, the minimum and maximum for the heat map. So this one starts at 10 Lux. Maybe I wanted to start at 800 Lux. And then the top I wanted to be, you know, much higher because these things are really stinking bright. Uh, these little spots. And I can start to see a heat map there on that focus plane. A uh, cool thing about it is, you know, you can you can turn to directions if you need to turn it on uh, different places, etc. And so the focus plane is a very, very cool tool that you're able to work with. Of course, I just dropped it, but that's okay. Definitely something uh, where you can kind of see as you move lights around, okay, it's really hot here or it's not hot there, et cetera, et cetera. Very usable as well. Uh, Pat asks, can you talk a little bit about presentation files? Yes. So presentation files are these wonderful little files that you're able to send uh, to people that don't have capture and they can open them. Um, so you have capture, you basically build, you know, what you want and then you're able to go ahead and actually send out an executable file. And so the cool thing about it in 2020, um, you can do it for Macs too. It used to just be for PCs. And so we'll just go to file, export presentation. And you see, by the way, with export as well, like a lot of other programs, you can export to the last five years of capture. And we're going to do presentation here. And then it's really just as simple as uh, doing that file 
And when you do export that, I'll just show you real quick. You get a couple things in that folder. Uh, one is you get the dot app, so that's the Mac one. Then you get the dot exe, and that's the Windows one. And uh, when you do launch that, actually, I'll just unzip the file real quick. Might as well show the whole process. When you do launch that on Windows, you get an executable file that you're now able to give to a client or someone that needs to viz, or maybe you bring it on another computer to visualize on, whatever. You can basically zoom in and out. There's some basic settings uh, for rendering in here. You know, you can, you can set up the universes um, but you're not going to be able to edit or anything like that. And so that's the difference between kind of bet between the presentation and a normal file. Uh, but presentation files are great. They absolutely are. And you can even, um, you can have your different cameras set up. You can go through those. You can even set up some different scenes and stuff. Uh, there's some cool stuff in there. Absolutely. So presentations, presentations are fun. I've used them a fair amount. Like I know the uh, Onyx team has a presentation file for for the demo that you can download and then work with that demo and pre-visualize stuff. It works really well. Absolutely. Uh, custom gobos, if you've got custom gobos in a moving lights. Um, yeah, absolutely, you can do that. You can totally do custom gobos. Um, they're down here in the custom gobos tab. First we press add there. And then we're gonna go ahead and go to the image, go find that image. Go find that Alation image. Oh no, that's not gonna work because it's gotta be a small file size. I think it's gotta be a ping. Maybe JPEGs are okay. I would use pings. Um, and it's gotta be 256 by 256. Yeah, it can be a JPEG or ping. It's just gonna be 256 by 256 or smaller. And as long as it's that size, um, it will be able to be used as a custom gobo then. And you can go uh, and modify that light then to add in those different custom gobos. Yeah, absolutely. 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 So, other questions that are coming in. Um, how do you render a scene image in Capture? Yeah, so there's the scenes tab here. Um, but what I'm trying to do, I admit that's one area that I don't use much, snapshots, that's what we're looking for. And so we go to snapshots right here, that's where it is. And then we can press record, record still or movie. At which point you've now got that view, you can play it back, etc. Uh, you can bring back the DMX of that and play back that DMX scene later without a console. Um, it's not outputting DMX like to the lights but it is doing it in the visualizer. So that's how you're able to bring in those DMX, uh, save that as a scene, there is a snapshot, and play that back. Uh, you can also, that was a still image, but you can do movies, you can bring back the DMX values, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So a lot of good stuff there. Um, but no, but I was looking for saving the image, actually taking an image. Usually I just use the screenshot, but you can, yeah, just go here to save image, control I. It's gonna save a JPEG of your current screen, basically the current alpha view. Um, or if you were in beta, it would save an image of the current beta view, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, can I visualize from the presentation file? Todd Zilla asks, yeah. That's one of the cool things about the presentation files. Like one you can check out, Toddzilla, just if you're, you know, looking to play with one, is if you go to support.obsidiancontrol.com, this is the Onyx one, you go to support, you can download Onyx here, and then right here is a capture training file, and it's one of those presentation files right here, okay? And then once you download that, you absolutely can connect it uh, the same way you connect the regular capture, and you can visualize all day long with that file. Um, as long as it's the EXE or the Mac application presentation file, you can completely visualize from it, which is really cool. Uh, EC Prod says, can you create movement for the movers without a console? Not really. You can't really create effects and such. Uh, so you can put them in different positions. Like if I go ahead and I grab my fixtures, 
and I go control U and I put them somewhere. I can go ahead and record a new snapshot. And I mean, I could record it as a movie. No, I can't do it without the console. Yeah, you definitely need a console to be able to do movies and uh, really create that movement. That's definitely uh, something you'd want a console for, for sure. Can you control camera views via DMX? You know, you can. You absolutely can. Let's uh, double check how to do that. So you first do, 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 do. all right. So we first go to design and then we'll go to our various views here. Take a drink here because I'm just curious about uh, yeah, somebody's asking about camera views and controls via DMX. And truth be told, it can be done. It's not something I ever use. I just move them myself or uh, set up the, the uh, different scenes. But you should be able to patch it. Say we patch it to universe one, fixture one. What does that do for us? Yeah. And that literally gives us from our console the ability to move that camera. Um, X, Y, course and fine. Uh, etc. Exposure, all kinds of stuff right in there. Yep, you can totally do that. As you see, the exposure went to zero because we patched that. So I'm gonna delete that if I can. Oh, I'll just have to unpatch it from the screen here. Unpatch that there. And then all of a sudden we can actually turn our lights on again. Woohoo. And so, yeah, you can totally uh, patch those camera controls. And I've seen people do some really crazy stuff with it. Personally, I haven't. I just usually park the camera in one place, but everybody does what they want, which is the great, great thing about the world. Let me turn these lights back on. All right. Can you have items like a truss move? Um, and so, yeah, there are the DMX, um, to, 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 just to show you, in the library here, there are the built-in DMX movers and rotators. And the DMX motor is basically designed to be like a chain motor or a winch that you can move, um, I believe. And I have not messed with them a ton, but I believe we can attach trusses and such to them and then be able to move them. Um, and so I apologize for not having more expertise there, but this is the basics webinar. <laughs> and that's uh, certainly not a super basic thing. But uh, yeah, that is totally do, doable. Yep. All right, more questions coming in. Uh, how to add a laser in Capture? And so, the way that I have used lasers before, I've used X Lasers program Accelerate. And I just had to reset my PC the other day, so I don't have it installed right now. But when you use Accelerate, it comes in as a media file. Um, and it basically, you basically patch the laser as a light. Um, and then this middle program basically goes between your lighting console and capture and takes the commands that you're giving the laser and turns into a media file which is then patched as a projector, basically like we did video projectors earlier. It basically patches it the same way um, to that laser and then you're able to visualize it. Um, and so there's, um, with theirs, there's how-to guides as well. Um, I can see with laser as well, you can connect them via Pangolin um, as well as CITP, which is like uh, media server thumbnails. So there's definitely different options there. Uh, depending on what specific laser you have and what kind of control and output you're using there. Awesome. If you import a plot, will fixtures automatically be created and positioned in Capture? Um, so there's a little bit of a process when you bring them in that um, basically allows you to, um, to bring in that DWG file and then you go ahead and you basically connect up the different um, the different items, and then it can bring those in. Yeah, absolutely. 
And so um, it's one of those things that people use for vector works or they do the DWG version. And then uh, what do they call it? There's a way that you basically connect up the instrument data and then it, um, if you're using vector works, basically syncs those up and says, okay, these are the instruments. Here's where, you know, and then has the data of where they are from the DWG and it kind of puts them together. Yeah. And so depending on where you're bringing your plot from, obviously that could vary. Um, but from vector works, it, it should bring that in just normally. Yeah. And nice and happily and good. Absolutely. So woo guys, that was a lot of good stuff so far. Absolutely. Totally uh, ready for more if you want. If not, that's cool. Definitely taking some good notes on uh, some of the things that people are asking the most questions about. So the next time we do this, we can uh, make sure we cover those in a little more depth, such as the video stuff that was really popular. But uh, yeah, uh, really quick, actually, the end of the webinar here, because I forgot to mention this before, is where do we find support? And so obviously, we've covered a lot in today's webinar. Um, they're you know, capture as a visualizer, there's a lot of depth to it, but what I really love about it is once you have down the basics like we've gone over today, you can really go to their user manual and find a lot of stuff. So where do we find all these stuff like the user manual? Um, so capture.se, if you haven't been there, is their website. Um, it looks like this. And on that site, there is the support tab, which has the forums in it. And the forums, um, are a great place to ask questions, especially if you've got, you know, questions about how to do something. That's a good place to search. And then here you also see the tab for documentation and that's where you're gonna find the manual. Uh, the manual also is linked to from help here in Capture. You can go to manual, boom, good to go. And then also there is a Capture Facebook group, the Capture Design and Visualization Group. A good place just if you wanna see what people are doing with Capture, um, ask, you know, stylistic questions, whatever, that's a good place to do so. And then um, in the past, and I'm sure in the future, once we get through this, there have been and probably will be uh, live trainings from Elation. So we've done those in the past, kind of a two-day um, Elation and Onyx training, or Capture in training and Onyx training together. And uh, yeah, we have those, uh, and we've had those in the past, should be more of those in the future as well. So with that, guys, any last questions? Because um, we've obviously got time here to hang out, and that's great. Um, definitely better to have enough time than to totally run out. Um, or else I'll just start doing stuff in Capture. I'm going to go ahead. Somebody asked about the Onyx file. I've already closed Onyx, but it was patched. Awesome, Giancarlo. Thanks for coming, by the way, Giancarlo, this evening. I know it's uh, getting late-ish, though most people in our industry are, are night people. <laughs> Thank you for coming at this time. Obviously, it's the middle of afternoon for us here in the U.S. And I know we've had people today from all over the world, which is like so awesome. I love the worldwide audience. It's great to have people. Yeah, it's 22.30. Okay, that's about what I was guessing. Cool. Awesome, guys. And we're here for questions. You know, all the panelists are here. A bunch of great people here. Very cool. So no Mendoza says, can I patch and control user fixtures on Capture? Chuck says, I know nothing. <laughs> oh, Chuck, telling him after some of these questions today, I'm like, I know nothing. You know, I've been using this for eight years, but that's okay. Um, can I control user fixtures? So you should be able to patch and control user fixtures on Capture, um, no Mendoza. Truthfully, I've never created a Capture fixture myself. Um, simply because you can request them. Um, and so you should be able to bring that in. I don't, I don't see why not. Um, let me just look. Capture can build fixtures for you and they've got a pretty quick turnaround. Um, yeah, so that's what I've always done. You don't, you don't have the ability to build your own fixture per se. Uh, it has to be modeled by Capture because they have to know how it's gonna interact in their environment and things like that. Okay, so, I actually, I think I case, know. 
Oh, in that sorry. case, you would, you would actually just control it. You would patch that fixture that you have built for you. Uh, and they're releasing library updates like every two or three days. It seems like every time I open Capture, there's a new update available. Yep, yeah, exactly. So I think maybe what you're, you're suggesting here is that you brought in a 3D model, but that's not really a DMX controllable fixture, but just request them. Um, what I tell people with all consoles is, you know, when you request a fixture, not only do you get it for you, but everybody else gets it for them. So, um, you know, Capture's got people, um, just like we had Ofer here. I don't know if he's still here because it's quite late for him. He's the Onyx uh, profile guy, and he's awesome. Capture's got their own people, and, uh, and they turn around quick. So no reason not to ask for them. All right, question about how to link Onyx on the same PC. Absolutely. So I'm going to go ahead. The, the order I like to do this in, just because it tends to work the best and be the most reliable, is to go ahead and open first Onyx. And I'm going to set up the Onyx end first. So I'll get this loaded here. Do, 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 do. And once we do get it loaded here, I'll just go into my file, whatever file you've got opened. And oh, one thing I like to do is use the Microsoft Loopback adapter. And so installing that, you can Google that. Um, but if you're in Windows 10 like I am, just to show you, I'm going to maximize this. Um, you can hit Windows X and then go to Device Manager, or you can just search uh, from the, the main bar here. Uh, Dev MGR, I believe. Yeah, we'll get you right there. And then you go to network adapters. And actually, no, you go to action, add legacy hardware. And you walk through this little wizard and basically um, install from the manually from a list. You then go to um, you find network adapters right here. It comes up with a list. You choose the Microsoft KM test. So you go to Microsoft KM test loopback adapter. You go next, 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 whatever you let it install. Then at that point, you basically have what looks like to the computer, another network card, but it's just kind of fake. Um, and that's what I use for, for looping back. So I go to the Onyx quick menu, hit the main menu. And then we're going to go ahead to network settings devices on the bottom, or uh, sorry, interfaces. Then go to Ethernet 2 or whatever it's called, the loopback adapter one. You know, this one is my Ethernet that I'm plugged into the internet with. That's my Wi-Fi. So this would be my, my loopback. Then I'll go switch it to Ether DMX here. Press apply. Go to Ether DMX, SACN. Turn it on. Set my universes that I want to send. Toggle it on on the Ether DMX interface, press apply. At this point, Onyx is sending that info. You're good to go. And so we'll go to capture. This is the easy part. And what normally happens, if this is the only source of DMX that you're streaming into your computer, then you just open your capture file and it should just find it. As we see here, boom, I can go to my universes tab. External universe, SEC and universe one is selected. Uh, if I was doing multiple universes, I'll just activate them. Say I do six universes. I can activate those. And I don't have anything patched there, so we're not going to see anything actually. But they would come up under here. We'd be able to select them and match them up with our universes in this file. And then you're good to go. At that point, as we can see, I'll minimize this again. I can turn on some various lights and we can see I'm controlling them, all these random lights within Onyx, just like that. Absolutely. So glad to have everybody here today. Again, we can hang out for some more questions if you all want. Uh, we're glad to answer them. Or maybe the rest of you guys are sleeping. Who knows? In the background, I accidentally left it up. Not really. But absolutely great having you here today.
Hopefully you can't hear the ice cream trucks outside <laughs> my house, which is hilarious. Uh, where is the network connection again? Uh, Jake the Snake, are you talking about in Onyx or in Capture? For Onyx, so we just go up here to the quick menu, go to menu, and then under network here, we're going to uh, we're going to go ahead and do settings. Turn on. Make sure that Ethernet two is set to Ether DMX. Let me just make it big. Press apply. Ether DMX SACN. Turn it on. Universes. Assign it to that un interface. Press apply. You're good to go. Uh, so that's where the network connection is. Awesome. We get some good questions. Awesome. That's not a question. Oh, in the computer itself. Oh, so installing the Microsoft KM test loopback adapter. So dev manager, so D-E-F-M-G-R from the Windows uh, setup. And you can Google this, like Microsoft loopback adapter. You pop that up. Go to, what is it? Oh, where'd it go? Do I have to click somewhere? I think I had to click somewhere, then action, add legacy hardware, walk through this, choose network adapter, choose Microsoft, uh, choose choose from the list rather, then choose Microsoft, KM test loopback adapter, press install, let it do its little happy dance, and then you've enabled that, that loopback adapter. Of course, in different win versions of Windows, it could look different, but it hasn't changed much in a while. Um, can you use highlight on a fixture group? Um, well, highlight's going to come out of the console versus out of capture. And so, yeah, in whatever console you're in, you certainly can do that. Um, but inside capture, I don't think there's a highlight that I know of. You can select lights, obviously, together and turn them on. Um, but I don't think there's a highlight function in capture. I've never used one. Um, just double check here. Don't tell me there is. No, there's not There's not a highlight. There's the grid um, color, but yeah, there's no actual highlight. Um, yeah, so setting the, the IP for the loopback adapter happens in Onyx when you set it to, to uh, when you set it to Ether DMX, it's gonna set that IP automatically. Um, owner said, great, thanks. When will you do the next webinar? So we're gonna do the same webinar. I'll probably add a little more depth to it just because we ended a little early today. And um, and it will be in two weeks, um, but it'll be the same thing again for a whole new group of people or the same people can come back and uh, ask more stump the professor questions. We're good with that. <laughs> totally good with that. Um, but yeah, we just had a good flurry of questions come in. If any other questions come in, we're glad to answer them here. Thanks, John Carlo. Have a good sleep. Thanks for hanging out here, man. I'll just put up my question screen in case anybody's not listening, but they're watching. So we've still got a good 50,000 people or so in the room, more or less. And we're glad to answer anything or else, you know, we'll get rolling. Either, either way works. But it's really been great for hanging out, hanging out with you guys today. And yeah, thank Elation for this, honestly, because uh, they're, you know, they're the ones uh, funding it for sure and, and making this happen. We're so glad to have them here. Of course, they're the capture distributor here in the U.S., um, et cetera. Absolutely. Yeah, any other webinars or other stuff um, that goes on is will all be posted publicly um, by Elation or by Obsidian Control Systems. Thanks, Kevin. So by, your learn stage lighting stuff is also awesome. Thank you, because uh, I work hard at that, obviously. <laughs> See you next week. Going to make dinner. Awesome. You must be in Eastern time and here in the U.S. <laughs> we now know where people are. Awesome. It's good. It is good. Brisbane, Australia, about to make some breakfast. Awesome. Very good. 
South Africa, glad to have you. 2230 there. Kenneth, I'm having some issues with scale when importing from Vectorworks. You know, Kenneth, I really don't know. Um, does anybody else on the team use Vectorworks on the, uh, the call? It's been a few years since I touched it. I yeah. don't use Vectorworks per se, but uh, in general, you just import a .dwg file. <clears throat> so it in, should be scaled, yeah. Yeah, well, and when you do import the .dwg, there, it, before you drag it into your drawing, you can set your scale, um, but you got to do that before you drag it into the drawing. Um, there is a scale. Um, I don't, obviously, I'm not sharing my screen, but in the process of opening that DWG, um, it opens up a new window. And then in that case, it uh, replicates the model in a new window. So you would go to import model. Yep. Um, yeah, I'll grab a DWG. Of course, I've got some. We've got shows in here. I just got to dig a little. Cool. You can find some good corporate events from a few years ago. Let's see which one of these is the DWG that one is. Depending on how big the file is, it may take a moment as it kind of scrubs the model. Yeah, this one's probably got some stuff in it, you know, like a whole hotel. Normal <laughs> stuff. <laughs> So it does this for a minute, apparently. Yeah. Yeah, if it's a large file. Oh, there we go. It's getting there. It's doing stuff, yeah. All right. Okay. So you see in the bottom, you have your drawing unit, and that is where you can change your scale. Um, so de de depending on uh, what scale you drew in, you go ahead and enter that into your uh, drawing unit. Um, you can then export... Uh, capture files. You can export models. Good. So that was say, the next question. Yep. So you do uh, have that next question. Um, you can export those in the file menu, and you can. What you would do is export the model. Is the is the command, and it would export as a DWG, which you then import into Vector. Well. So we brought it in and then, yeah, like you said, file export, model, DWG, boom, send it, then you can open it. Cool. Awesome. Very cool. And then it's scale. It's good to go. So yeah, that should, that should fix any scale issues you have. Just making sure you match up that initial scale with the, oh, I remember this show with uh, whatever you used in your other program. We should be good to go. Awesome, yeah, as, as noted in the chat from Justin, um, you know, it's always important when doing any kind of drafting to always, 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 always make sure you're working off the same scale because um, it'll cause issues down the road and being careful about that uh, is definitely, definitely worth your 10 minutes. Yeah, Kenneth, so probably what's going on is uh, a difference between the scale here in views um, down here. Is that it? Where is it? Hide. Yeah, the grid height and width, maybe. Um, it may just be something you have to play around with to find what the matchup is. Awesome. Very cool. Awesome, everybody. Well, thanks for hanging out today, as noted. Any other questions? Your lovely panel of nice people are here to answer them. If not, that's fine as well, too. Or as Chuck Dillingham says, 
He knows nothing. But uh, together we can smack our brains together and find the find the answers. Groups in capture, yeah. So we went over this briefly, but it's pretty simple. Um, and so just to walk through it again, we just go ahead and select our lights, first of all. Let me go, here we go, we'll just use this view. So we go ahead and select our lights. This is actually, well, that's a six bar actually. So it's already a six light bar. That's the actual model, I think. But if I select a couple lights here, I can go ahead and I think I can do it here, but also I can do it where I usually do it is in the uh, design and then fixture groups. And then I can just press add once I've selected the lights I want. And we see here, I get the units in there in the group. Um, if I need to update that or change it, I can just, you know, select it already or not. And then I can maybe add the light that I was going to add to it. I can then press more, I can then press update, and it adds in that new feature. You're able to do that. Also, um, you can, under more, you can update it to remove things and you can clone it to make a copy. And then once you've done that, you can change things up in that group, add or remove. Chuck knows more than he lets on, that's the truth. How do we switch Imperial to metric? Oh goodness, there's a place. Because uh -huh. I thought it used to all be an Imperial. So I would have thought it was right here in the, uh, right in here. But where does it hide? Where does it hide? There's a spot, there's a setting. Second line down. Oh, see, right there. See, I'm staring right at it and I'm like, I know it's going to be in this screen. And so, yeah, use computer settings as default, but then there's the uh, the options here, metric or imperial. So, yeah, no worries, man. <laughs> Nothing like staring right at the screen and going, I know it's in this window. It has to be. <laughs> Absolutely. So we can stop using these silly American uh, measurements. <laughs> and, yeah, noting, yeah, you can type in the units like we actually did today you know, earlier on, you can literally type like 5M for five meters, even if you're in inches and it's going to convert it. Um, you know, same with inches. If you're in the world of meters, you can use the, the feet and inches symbol and then let it convert, which again, you know, yeah, allows you to, to convert that right up. Very cool. And yeah, just looking at things, the uh, Onyx 101 should be back at our normal time next week, which is 9 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Central, noon Eastern. And so we'll see you there next week if you want to check that out. It's all about, you know, learning new stuff during this time. I know a lot of the manufacturers are having opportunities like these, and uh, we're glad you've come today to take part of this one. Awesome, guys. I think I'm going to hang it up since we've been uh, chatting here for almost three hours, but it's been good. I think we answered all the questions we could, and uh, just thankful to Bob, especially for hanging out today, Chuck, and uh, Chuck and Chuck and Chuck and Matthias, because um, Bob is the, um, whatever your job title is, that's in charge of capture now in the U.S. Thankful to have you on here. And uh, yeah, I think we'll hang it up, guys. Thank you so much for uh, hanging out today. It's been great having everybody, and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks, everybody.